Good afternoon, everyone. We are here because we need to save the yellow taxi industry. As also, we need to level the playing field in New York City so that everyone is able to take advantage of the opportunity that our city provides by playing by the same rule and regulation. Welcome to today's hearing of the City Council Transportation Committee. I'm Danis Rodriguez, the chair of the committee. First, let me recognize my colleagues who are here today, Council Member Garani, Richard, Reynoso, uh, Gredential, and Baca. Today's hearing focuses on an issue of vitally important not only to transportation in our city, but to its very identity and character. As I say, when, I, when we last held a hearing on these issues in February, the yellow taxi is an icon of New York City. Yellow taxis have been synonymous with New York for decades, serving a vital role in our city's transportation system for those who live, work, and visit here. It is also no secret that today the industry is facing unprecedented difficulties. Fares and ridership are down considerably. Daily fare box revenue for yellow taxis were 10 percent lower in December 2016 than in prior year and prior year and 25 percent lower compared to December 2012. Total yellow taxi trips per day in April 2017 were down 15.8 percent compared to April 2016 and down 33.7 percent compared to April 2010. And early this month, 46 foreclosed medallion were bought by a hedge fund for just $186,000 each, well below the price that many current medallion owners paid for the medallions, yet another troubling sign for the industry. In recent years, major credit unions have had historically served the industry, have faced mounting red ink and been taken over by state authorities. Many taxis now sit idly, even at the busiest times of the day, instead of being out on the road serving passengers. And many individual medallion owners are facing foreclosure and bankruptcy, upending their personal lives and destroying their savings and hurting their families. These are small businesses owner, many of them immigrants who invested in a medallion in hope of achieving the slice of the American dream. It has long been my position that there can be a place for everyone in our taxi and for hire vehicle industry. New York is a city of opportunity and innovation. We welcome those who want to come here and offer New Yorkers new options for transportation and for making a living. But this does not have to come at the expense of those who have invested their savings in the taxi industry, looking to find success in New York while serving all of us by moving us around our great city. That's why I'm proud to have worked closely with the TLC to streamline the medallion system and lessen some of the administra administrative burden of both owning and driving in the yellow taxi industry. In April 2016, the Council passed legislation, which I was proud to have introduced, that ended the distinction between taxi and for hire vehicle licenses for drivers, creating one universal driver's license for both of these sectors. Now drivers can, mo can more easily move between sectors based on their own individual needs and preferences. And owners now have a much bigger pool of drivers to recruit that front. This past March, we passed two additional bills that I introduced, which eliminate the distinction between individual and mini fleet medallions, in addition to losing other requirements related to medallion ownership and lowering the medallion transfer tax. Now medallion owners can more easily buy and sell the medallions, free from some of the most limiting restrictions they have previously faced. The TLC has also taken its own action, including eliminating the owner must drive rules 
extending vehicle retirement schedules and instituting a pilot program that allows drivers to pay a percentage of their earning during a shift to lease a taxi instead of having to pay a flat fee upon front. Despite all of, all of this, it is clear that the industry is still facing unprecedented challenges. That's why I have introduced Intro 963, which will create a task force to study the issue and recommend further changes the city can make to stabilize the industry and increase medallion values. When it comes to the taxi and for hire vehicle industry, our role is to protect the right and safety of the passengers and drivers and to ensure that the public is being served in the best way possible. It is certainly, certainly not our job to stand in the way of investment and opportunity as long as any action we take does not imperil those important objectives. I would like to welcome Chair Miro Joshi and the other representatives of the TLC who are here with us today. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to hearing from you about how TLC has approached this important issue and to discuss what more we can be done. Uh, we will pause to, since we have quorum, to take a vote on another issue, then we will get back into the TLC. So we've been joined by Council Member Rose, Ching, and Constantinides. Now that we have quorum, we'll be addressing the bill that we'll be voting. Today we'll be voting on two important pieces of legislation into 1031-A introduced by Council Member Lebing and myself, which require DOT to conduct a study of traffic congestion due to truck deliveries in the most congested parts of Manhattan and Brooklyn, and to implement any recommend, recommend any recommendation measures to alleviate that congestion. It is clear that in the area of the Amazon and other rapidly growing e-commerce businesses, truck deliveries are a growing contributors to traffic congestions and pollution on our streets. While certain amount, amount of commercial traffic is an inevitable, inevitable by product or a growing and vibrant economy, the congestion problem in our, in our city risks hurting not only our economy, but the everyday lives of New Yorkers who are stuck on a slow moving buses, wind up paying higher costs for goods, and are forced to breathe more polluted air. Polluted air. This committee explored these issues at a, robust, at, at a robust oversight hearing in June and I have been very vocal that the city needs a comprehensive congestion pricing plan like Move New York to truly make a transformative impact on addressing these challenges. In the meantime, it is my hope that the study and recommendation that will result from this bill will produce meaningful and creative ideas for how we can tackle the, pro the role truck deliveries play in the um, in our city. Intro 1375-A introduced by Council Member Matthew by request of a starting island board president auto will require DOT to notify council members, board presidents, and community boards when he approves a permit to open a so-called protected street, which is a street that has been reconstructed or resurfaced with the, within the previous five years. Protected streets rules are there for a reason. After the city invested significant resources, it takes to repave or reconstruct a street, and after the community has endured all the associated disruptions, such workers, utilized companies, and other entities should not be allowed to come in and rip the street right back up unless absolutely necessary. But too often, that's exactly what happens, and to make matters worse, Communities and elected officials are too often kept in the dark about what is being done. This bill will make a big difference by ensuring that local communities are aware when this disruptive and frustrating work is being done in their neighborhood. I'm proud to co-sponsor Intro 1031-A within my colleague, Council Member Levine, and 
he's not here with us. Uh, neither my colleague council member Matt is here, but we're gonna be moving on. And I would like to thank the bill sponsor, Speaker Melissa Marbiberito and the administration for all the work on these important bills. I now call for a vote on proposed intro 1031-A and proposed intro 1375-A. I recommend a yes vote and I ask a committee clerk to please call the roll. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote, Committee on Transportation. Chair Rodriguez. I vote aye, and I would like to add my name if I'm not in the Council Member Matthews bill. Constantinidis. I vote aye. Gorodnik. Aye. Vaca. Aye. Chin. Aye. Rose. Richards. Aye. Reynoso. Aye. A vote of eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Both items have been adopted by the committee. Thank you. Now let's go back to the oversight hearing. And now, and I now ask the committee council to administer the affirmation, and they invite TLC, the commissioner, Josie from TLC, to deliver their testimony. Uh, but before that, thank you for to all med the individual medallion owners who are here. You are the face of this industry. You are more than 6,000 individuals that own and drive your vehicle. And as we need to support the other members of the state and of the industry, especially those 6,000 hardworking New Yorkers also deserve, and you should know that you have our support. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. You may begin. Uh, good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Mira Zoshi, Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. And with me today is Midori Valdivia, our Deputy Commission for Finance and Operations. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share the TLC's views on taxi medallions and more specifically intro 963, which would require the formation of a task force to study taxi medallion values and make recommendations that would strengthen the taxi industry. The yellow cab is an iconic symbol of New York City, and each day hundreds of thousands of people hail yellow cabs in Manhattan to reach meetings, fulfill family obligations, and tour our city. For decades, many New Yorkers, including many recent arrivals, have seen driving a taxi as a good job providing a stable income. The medallion situation has changed in New York City, and I want to offer some thoughts today about those changes which have an impact on small businesses and on our licensed drivers. The taxi medallion gives its owner the exclusive right to accept street hails anywhere in New York City, as well as the right shared by local car services, app-based services, and traditional black cars to transport passengers who book trips in advance by prearrangement. For decades, the number of medallions remained steady, around 12,000. And then, beginning in 1995, the state legislature and city council on different occasions authorized the TLC to issue more medallions putting the total number of medallions today at 13,587. These new medallions were sold at auctions conducted by the TLC. The average bid for a medallion increased with each successive auction, ultimately to 1.2 in March of 2014. Medallions are transferable and are frequently sold after auction in private sales. The amount of these sales is reported to the TLC and the transaction is subject to a city transfer tax, which thanks to recent legislation sponsored by Chair Rodriguez was reduced from 5% to 0.5%. Like the medallions sold at auction, medallions transferred privately for as much as 360,000 in 2004 and for as much as 1.1 million in 2014. Since 2014, medallion transfer prices have fallen. In 2016, medallions transferred for between 325,000 and 750,000. 
This year, medallions have transferred for between 150,000 and 580,000. This month, there were two large sales in <clears throat> one selling bank financed per the per in one the selling bank financed the purchase of 49 medallions at 335,000 per medallion, and in the other, a single lot of 46 medallions was sold for $186,000 each. During this same time, the for hire vehicle sector has grown to historical proportions. In late 2011, the TLC issued the first of many for hire vehicle bases licenses to Uber, an app-based transportation company. And since then, many other app-based companies have begun operations in New York City. These companies, like any other for hire vehicle bases, are subject to the TLC rules and can only dispatch drivers and vehicles that are vetted and licensed by the TLC. The technology these companies use has been efficient for dispatching vehicles, and drivers and passengers have responded favorably. From 2011 to present, the number of for hire vehicles has more than doubled, from around 35,000 to roughly 90,000. We see similar growth in the number of FHV drivers, from nearly 55,000 in 2011 to over 90,000 in 2016, at which time, thanks to Chair Rodriguez, the barrier that prohibited licensed drivers from driving in both taxi and FHV sectors was removed with the, establish of the establishment of the universal TLC driver's license. Today, the TLC licenses more than 170,000 drivers who can operate in both taxi and for hire vehicles. In November 2014, the TLC mandated that all FHV bases provide trip data, as had long been available for taxis. From this, we know that the for hire sector completed roughly 133 million trips in 2016 and is on course to do more than 10 million more this year, about 143 million trips in total. By comparison, during this period of growth in the FHV sector, total annual taxi trips and annual taxi fare box revenue decreased. In 2011, taxis made 216 million trips and generated nearly 2.3 billion in fares. And in 2016, taxis made over 130 million trips and generated roughly 1.8 billion in fares. This downward trend in taxi trips and fare box revenue continues this year. Because historically medallion purchases are financed purchases, discussion of valuation must include a review of lending practices over time. As with the housing market, liberal lending practices can increase both demand and prices, and conservative lending practices lower them. Prior to 2014, many banks offered no or low deposit balloon loans that were due in full after three years, requiring frequent refinancing, often at much higher interest rates. With each refinancing, many banks offered to lend additional funds, further increasing the debt burdened on the borrower. As the loan increased, so did the price at which medallions were bought and sold in private transactions. And consequently, the higher the sale price, the more banks were willing to loan. Today, banks and their regulators recognize that value must be tied directly to income stream and service levels. Regulators are scrutinizing medallion portfolios and in some cases taking over the lending institution after uncovering unsound banking practices. There are few available funds to finance medallions, so when sales occur, they are most frequently either seller financed or ca cash transactions. As I mentioned before, medallions still sell, but at lower prices than their historic highs. New purchasers may represent awareness of this continuing business opportunity. Those newly, bought, those newly buying medallions may represent an awareness of driving a yellow taxi as a continuous opportunity within, New York City, within the New York City brand. Going forward, taking advantage of this opportunity will likely mean increased integration of technology and business operations. For taxis, this may include using apps to help drivers find their daily and weekly lease taxis, sign in and out of shifts, and get their compensation directly deposited and to be paid on a commission on fares. 
Other revenue models may also appeal to medallion owners. Already we've seen garages show interest in commission-based operations rather than the traditional leasing system that many drivers work under today. Other medallion owners may approach revenue as, as a percentage of fares earned, which go up and down with seasonality, rather than today's fixed monthly lump sum payment model. Both of these business strategies give medallion owners and operators a vested interest in the quality and responsiveness of service for drivers and passengers, something that was typically only true for owner drivers. TLC has not simply observed market trends. Medallions are regulated assets, so during this time of change, the TLC has reviewed and revised regulations to increase flexibility for medallion owners, operators, and drivers. Recent medallion-specific reforms include eliminating the, eliminating the owner must drive requirement so that independent medallion owners have greater flexibility to drive or lease their taxi. Eliminating the distinction between independent and corporate medallions and lowering the transfer tax from 5% to 0.5% to bring about greater liquidity in the market. And that was done with the help of the Transportation Committee who led the process. Removing the prohibition on non-cash payments from taxi garages to drivers, allowing electronic or other payment methods so long as they are offered at no additional cost to the driver. Extending vehicle retirement periods, giving owners a choice on whether or not to install a partition, supporting the use of apps to hail and pay for taxis, allowing garages to recruit from the entire universe of drivers, today over 170,000, rather than only a small, smaller population that went to taxi-specific school. In addition to these reforms, in October 2015, we gave taxi owners greater flexibility to lease outside of the TLC's lease cap rules by either splitting fares with their drivers or leasing for fewer than 12 hours. I'm happy to report that just last month, almost two years after we made it available, one operator has taken advantage of this opportunity and reports considerable uptick in drivers working in his garage. We also recently launched Citywide Accessible Dispatch, which allows taxi drivers to reach the meet, receive the metered fare for the trip, plus a dispatch payment to compensate for the time spent traveling to the pickup point and assisting the passenger. And finally, we're partnering with the MTA to test out accessoride trips in both taxis and FHVs. Intro 963. I'd like to now comment on Intro 963, which would establish a task force to study taxicab medallion values and the impact of taxi medallion sales on the city's budget and to make recommendations to increase the value of taxi medallions. I want to first note that since this bill was first introduced in October 2015, the TLC and Chair Rodriguez have taken significant steps many of which I've outlined above, to ensure the continued vitality of the taxi industry. Additionally, there is a substantial amount of information that is already publicly available to better assess actual medallion values, trip and fare data, maximum lease caps, leasing income, gas prices, and more. We continue to identify and publish relevant information so that the City Council, the TLC, and the market can continue to make informed decisions. The TLC always supports developing new proposals to help our licensees, and we're interested to hear proposals for additional steps that the city might take. Government reform is important to ensure that regulation is not an obstacle to progress, but in today's market, it is not the only way to bring about meaningful change. We are seeing new approaches from within the industry that leverage technology to attract passengers and drivers with more flexible business models, and we welcome these initiatives. We also think it's important that membership of a task force reflect today's industry. For example, due to reforms that I mentioned, some of the task force members represent driver categories that no longer exist. Any task force would also benefit from individuals that represent the full diversity of the industry, including medallion owners, garages, and those who dispatch and lease taxis, as well as the people behind the wheel, the drivers. So I thank you for allowing me to testify today, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Before we get back into the questions, I would like to also recognize Councilmember Van Bramer, uh, Greenfield and Miller, 
Uh, and now we're gonna be uh, going back to the vote or the other bill. Introductions, 1031A and 1375A. Council Member Van Bramer. I vote aye on all. Greenfield. I vote aye and ask that my name be added to 1031 and 1375, please. Thank you. Miller. I vote aye. The vote now currently stands at 11 in the affirmative. Okay. So I have a, I'm gonna be asking you two questions then I'm gonna be giving the opportunity for my colleagues to ask questions. And before I ask a question, I'd like to share with everyone that in this coming state meeting, I'm gonna be introducing a new legislation that will allow a medallion owner to have two car, a, 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 instead of to have two car per medallion. So this is something that also we hope that, we hope to have a conversation with the industry and see how he also can be helpful to this industry. It, again, the bill will be introduced in this coming state meeting. We will allow a medallion owner to be able, if he or she made a decision to use another car, to have the flexibility. And I also hope that as we are having conversation with TLC, that also we take advantage of a sex right. Uh, there's a market we believe that is there for New Yorkers that it also needs services. And a sex right is, you know, a move a half a billion dollar fund, and we believe that this is something also we should think about it, how we can help the industry. But I have two questions. One is, Commissioner, can you explain a little bit more the extending uh, uh, the vehicle retirement period? Um, prior to 2014, 2015, there were different retirements depending on how your taxi vehicle was used. So some people had a three-year retirement, and those were typically the taxis that were being used in garages. They were out every day. Some taxis had a five-year retirement. Those were ones where there was a committed um, a committed driver, so it was more of a steady driver. And some had a seven-year retirement. Those were ones where there's an owner driver, accessible vehicles, and hybrid vehicles. What we did through rulemaking was extend everybody to the seven-year retirement. There was one group of taxi medallions that didn't get the advantage of that rule because they, um, they, were, they were prior to the effective date of the rule. Um, and in recognition of that, we have extended those medallions for an additional year as well. Great. And, let, me, and let us make one comment. Why we feel very comfortable extending the retirement dates is because taxis come to get inspected pursuant to a federal consent decree three times a year and they undergo our 200 point inspection. So if any time if they fail an inspection, um, regardless of whether they have a seven year retirement, they have to come off the road. And with that kind of a system of checks and balances, we feel very comfortable with the extensions that we've given, that we're not putting the public at risk. Great. And, and can, first of all, I'm happy to hear you know, that we can work with you, your TLC under your leadership uh, on the potential task force that we can create. Can you describe would, and, and I like your ending as you say, uh, how important is that membership of the task force reflect today industry? If you would like to imagine the best, you know, uh, the composition of the task force, what do you think will be important that to be included in that task force in order to represent, you know, member of the industry, not only from the governments, but also from, from the, from the owners, uh, ownership and, and also academic banking. Who should, then who should compose that task force? Um, so I can give some thoughts on additional membership, um, and some of them we laid out in our testimony. Um, that would be individual medallion owners. Um, although that title is gone, there are several individuals who own their medallion and own their car, and their perspective is very important. Um, it's important to have uh, people represent that actually run garages and fleets of medallions because improvements to operation are um, an, an excellent way for medallion taxis to be higher util have higher utilization on our streets. 
Uh, you certainly will need drivers, um, long-term drivers and new drivers, um, and drivers that maybe have experience in other sectors so they can better identify some of the differences and what makes driving in one sector more attractive than driving in another. Um, and another uh, sector that, that might be helpful to have represented here that I didn't mention in my testimony is the lending, um, somebody from lending institutions because many of the medallion loans, as you know, um, are hitched to uh, outstanding loans that are difficult to pay back in these times and also difficult to understand in terms of the meaning of the valuation um, because that's, they are far greater, the, the outstanding loans, than what today's sales prices are. And so coming to um, an agreement with banks on how to right-size those loans could be an incredible benefit for the individual borrowers. Great. Before I, my colleague has a question, I'd like to ask the couple who is here, can you come with us, please? Pueden venir para acá ustedes, please? Can bring in here, if you don't mind. Parece mi aquí. I just want for my colleague, you know, for the audience in the TLC to know, these are the faces of individual medallion owners. You know, this family came to me like a few years ago. The gentleman here, he believed that by investing in the medallion, he was securing his retirement. Now he's been dealing with tough medical health issues. And his wife and hand is trying to survive. And I think that when we have this conversation, as we will be, you know, listening to the testimony and my colleague asked questions, I just want everyone to understand that this family represents 6,000 individual medallion owners that they don't know what to do. Because the promise that we, the dream that we sell, that we sold to them, you know, 30, 40, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that it was safe for them to invest and that they could have their retirement secure. That's not happening today. So I just wanted you know, to let you know that as you answer any question for my colleague, and I got to give a lot of credit. Great champion, someone that you've been doing her job, being fair to everyone who really understand this industry. But I, want, I believe it is important that everyone understand that we are behind the game that we don't know if we can save this industry, and that we're playing with investments, not only whoever owns a few hundred medallions, but also 6,000 individual owners that they don't know what to do in the investment they made decades ago. Gracias, Thank you. Thank I would, I would also like to comment that, um, well, I mean, I, I look a lot out here and I see very, a lot of familiar faces of individual owners that, um, whose stories I personally know because they've come in our office and we've discussed them and we've had a very long hearing. I think it lasted six hours in April, which was for anyone who attended extremely painful, um, the stories one after another um, for that length of time of the financial crisis that many families are in because of the outstanding loans they have, um, you know, I think you'd have to be made of metal not to have that affect you. Um, we have also worked with Neighborhood Trust, which is willing to provide free financial advice for any medallion owner. The, the questions that often came to us were, the loan is outstanding. Should I pay back the loan? Should I go into bankruptcy? What's the best course of action? And in those cases, we'd want to make sure, and, and this is the resource that is now available, um, that, that people have somebody to talk to independently about what their choices are, as hard as those choices may be. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Commissioner, I appreciate what the city has done, but I really wonder if it's enough. I have met with constituents who are in danger of losing their homes because they bet on a regulated market in New York City, and the price has dropped 
almost 90%, which is not quite tulip bulb mania proportions, but it's pretty bad. And while I've listened to what you've had to say and I appreciate, um, I don't really get a sense of urgency here. This is an extremely important industry in the city of New York. It employs thousands and thousands of people, many of whom are my constituents. And I really would like to get more of a sense of urgency out of the Taxi and Limousine Commission. And I'd like to hear from you what steps you think we should be taking to level the playing field so that people who drive yellow cabs who entered into a contract with the city of New York ha can come home every night and feed their families and pay their mortgages. So I think there's one aspect, which is the lending aspect, something that, you know, um, we as the commission and you as the council may have limited authority um, but there are outstanding loans that are very difficult to pay back and represent an amount that is not matching what the medallion is worth. Um, so a way to right-size those loans, I think, would create incredible relief for medallion owners. And there are also other things that I think we can work on together. Um, there's the ability of taxis to do work beyond traditional hail, and we'd love to explore that with the taxi industry on how they can do more prearranged work and do work through apps so that they are getting the same passenger base that Uber and Lyft are getting. There's a generation out there that only looks at their phone to get car service, and we need to make sure that taxis are well positioned so that they're one of the options when somebody does. I appreciate that many of, many of the people in the city, including many of my constituents, love the new app services. Um, but I'm wondering if the, if the playing field is really level for everybody. Um, I know that taxi Passengers have to pay a surcharge at certain times. Um, taxis uh, should, should all be, in my opinion, should be handicap accessible. But that's not required for some of the other app services. And um, I'm wondering if there's room there, wiggle room there, that the, the commission has considered so that um, we can level the playing field. Um, in terms of accessibility, in July we published proposed rules that would put accessibility mandates on the for hire sector. Today, well let me, let me actually step back to clarify the existing accessibility mandates for the um, for hire sector, which is to provide equivalent service. And our proposal is uh, much more tailored mandates so that they get there. Uh, we're having a hearing on that rulemaking um, this week on Thursday. I know that there's other proposals that people think are more fitting, so we'll hear those as well, as well as hearing from passengers who um, have felt the gap in service as the app-based for hire vehicle services have become more and more popular with the general public. Um. You had, I appreciate that, you had mentioned, and you, you addressed it when you were speaking to me, um, that some of this may have been, um, some of the, the, whatever, the bubble, whatever we want to call it, and the price of medallions, may have been contributed to by uh, easy credit or something like that. But at the same time, um, this city, in 2014, auctioned off um, medallions at an average price of $1.2 million. So do you feel that the city was taking advantage of that bubble? That's a lot of money. It brought in a lot of money. And traditionally, the sales of medallions, new medallions, have brought in, you know, um, a huge bankroll for the city of New York. The, the funds, um, the determination of what the upset price is for an auction is set by the Office of Management and Budget um, based on past transactions. My understanding is it's based on tr past transactions. So they look at what the most recent out-of-auction transactions are, and they come up with an upset price. Um, the upset price, which I don't have off the top of my head for both of those auctions, although Midori can get it for us and I can get it to you shortly, is basically what the minimum bid was. And, and those, uh, those medallions did sell for well over those upset prices. I don't, can't speak to exactly the thought process when that auction was being held or when it was designed. That was a different administration and different architects. But I can say that our, but, our but it purpose, took place, this administration took office in 
the 2014 one did. Yes. Yeah. It was, it was already here. It was already, the 2013 one was the larger one in the fall, and the scheduling of the 2014 ones, I think, was well underway. So, yes, you're correct. It did happen under this administration, not under my leadership. I wasn't there at the time of those auctions because I left city service for a few months and came back. But none, I don't want to separate myself from those auction prices because those are real numbers and those are real loans. And as Chairman Rodriguez pointed out, those are real individuals behind each one of those loans, which is something we need to address. But the, the sale prices are based on what's happened recently, and that's where OMB gets the upset price number. So I guess if we did another sale, those prices would be much lower. Yeah, and I think the, the thought that I didn't finish is what our concern is, is service. That there's cars on the street and that there's people that can get accessible taxis when they need them. There's people who can hail a taxi if they don't have a smartphone, if they don't have a credit card, or they choose not to use it. And that there's a version of for hire transportation that people cannot be refused from. The first car that you see is the one that needs to pick you up. And if that doesn't happen, and there are those occasions where that doesn't happen, and we're disappointed every time we hear about them, when people report that to us, we are able to prosecute those drivers. I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Chairman, if you'll let me, just one more question for this round. Um, one of the things that, I, when, I, when I met with taxi drivers recently, one of the things that they mentioned is what you mentioned uh, among your last comments before you went into intro 963, um, that you're partnering with the MTA on Accessor Ride. Um, can you get into that a little more with us here? Is it, have tests taken place? Where are we at with that? Yeah, there, we went through several months of proof of concept with the MTA, working very closely with the MTA and um, the two providers that that provide in-taxi technology today. They also have apps, and I'm glad that the MTA is looking to an app-based solution for future paratransit passengers. Then, more recently, the MTA passed a formal pilot where one app, the Curb app, is now providing between 1,250 rides in yellow and green taxis on weekdays and about 900 rides in yellow or green taxis on weekends. 10% of those rides are happening in wheelchair accessible vehicles. So this is just the beginning. Extremely good customer feedback and extremely high fulfillment rates, which are the two things that really matter in any app-based service. Both of those are present, so we're fully confident that the MTA has what it needs to expand, and we look forward to them bringing on the other taxi technology provider who also has an app, uh, the Arrow app, to provide even more accessoride service in yellow and green taxis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Commissioner, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I need to excuse myself to go and vote to the Land Use Committee. My council member Miller will be here. Next we have council member Chin follow, and then followed by council member Miller. Council member Chin. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Uh, I mean, it's it just really sad. I mean, I, I remember in the previous administration, in the Bloomberg administration, the taxi medallion was helping to fill the budget gap. And they were selling for a lot of money, and the city was basing, you know, the budget on that a lot. And then all of a sudden now it just plummets so much, and it's hurting so many families, especially immigrant families, who saved so hard and thought that, you know, they finally got a medallion and, and they can plan for their future, and now they're stuck. So I think that we really have to do more to really help these families. I mean, the number of trips that you, you were talking about in your testimony uh, from these, you know, for hire vehicle, it just, I mean, the number is very huge. And there's got to be a way that we, can, we have to manage that growth. Uh, all of a sudden, they're all over the place. And one of the things that I don't think the city is really looking at is the environmental impact. All of a sudden, we got all these cars. And especially my district in Low Manhattan, I see people, you know, um, taking these uh, cars, a lot of it was the Uber, whatever. And it's like they could have just walked to the corner and they could get a yellow taxi easily. 
But no, they wanted somebody to pick them up right in front of their house. And it's causing a lot of chaos and con congestion, especially on these narrow streets. So what I'm asking you is what is the TLC doing to really help the yellow taxi industry? So you They're raise a good so point greatly. about how the FHV industry is different than all of the other sectors we regulate, and that is it has no growth control mechanism, um, no built-in environmental review, no built-in community board review, no built-in DOT review. But that's not fair. Why couldn't we institute those? That, I mean, it was like... That's something that um, is under your jurisdiction, and I don't have the authority to do that. I can't limit the number of vehicles or drivers that we license. You, you cannot. No. I mean, they should be playing by the same rules. They have two sets of rules based on state and local law. The medallion has a capped system of vehicles, and the FHVs has an uncapped. And the agency's jurisdiction isn't large enough to make a change in terms of the number of vehicles that come in under the FHV sector. So, you, so do, you, um, do you suggest that we definitely need to do something to restrict and manage the number? I mean, this I is just... I think we've done a very important first step, which is gather trip data so that we as a city understand where are these trips happening um, and are these cars being utilized in the best way possible. Um, and we recently get drop-off data as well, which will tell us and the public a lot more about where the activity is happening. With that kind of information, um, I think we would work with DOT and City Council to understand what exactly is the right mechanism to create some sense of alleviation to the, some of the problems that you've pointed out. So how soon will you have this data available? We're just now getting it, but it takes quite a while for us to compile it from 900 bases. Um, but we're happy to keep you up to date on as soon as we're able to give a public report on it. Do you have any projection in terms of time frame? Within I'd six say months, before, three definitely months? before the end of the year, definitely. Okay, so within three months, you yeah, should be able to get something. Now you're saying three months, but that's good. You're negotiating. <laughs> well, that's before we'll the end try. Of the year. How about that? <laughs> yeah, because we need to do something. Yeah, no, uh, we're happy to, to give you that information, and and you can see like in, on a map. It's you know, when you map the trips, you see where it's all happening, and I think that's very important for city planners and for city council to know. Yeah, because we institute you know the green cab to help all the other boroughs and upper Manhattan, whether that is effective or not. And we would really like to know these, you know, these app-based yeah, for hire vehicle, are they really going to neighborhoods where people couldn't get a taxi? Or are they just concentrating, you know, in the central business district or in, in lower Manhattan and Manhattan neighborhood where there is availability uh, of yellow caps and, and other um, services? So we look forward to sharing the data with you, and it'll be able to answer some of those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you Councilmember Chen. Chen. So we do this. We do this. We do this. <laughs> OK, please, we do this. And uh, Thank you. Um, so I, I do want to follow up with, the council, with, with Councilmember Chen and also my colleagues before me in that we, we, we certainly um, are very much concerned. My district, like, like uh, many other working class communities in the city, uh, have a lot of uh, yellow cab operators. And I, I certainly, while knocking on the doors during the summer, I, I've heard their concerns and I've, I've, I've heard their disappointment in the city that they have made these major investments. Um, that not only do they have uh, these these notes, um, they have mortgages and, and home mortgages as well that are predicated on them, the services that they're delivering, and and that's not happening. It's not happening because we are not controlling and regulating the industry that folks have have pretty much come in and and that we have regulated them in a way that what you can do when you can do it, but not just that who can do it, and we have specific criteria, checks and balances. And uh, on these operators and the owners, we've allowed people to enter the industry who don't 
have to meet the same standards, and that's unfair. At the very least, we have to ensure that App Base has to do the same thing, right? So that I had my father-in-law over last weekend, and, and, and he turned in his radio on his black car because he couldn't compete, and he's just pretty much given up. And that was an investment that he couldn't afford to lose, as in many of the folks here that we see today that invested. And so my concern is, number one, is whether or not we say that we don't have the ability to regulate those folks coming into the industry. Um, I know that we've done with this committee and through legislation a lot of uh, work ensuring that those who are operating within the industry were operating safely, efficiently, and that they were serving a, a tar everyone, a, a target audience. And what I see is that the yellow cab industry has to adhere to those criteria and others don't, and that's an unfair advantage, right, certainly. And it continues to happen because we recently have chariot app service for vans entering, and all the work that we did around commuter van, they don't adhere to any of those. Um, uh, any of the policy and legislation that we put forth, and that's unfair. And so um, I think that certainly that there is something that we could do more, but I also believe that in these certifications, you mentioned about licensed drivers and certifications. Everyone who, dri who drives a yellow cab has a certification. Everyone who drives an MTA bus has a certification, but yet you can drive an app-based part-time driver, a license for two weeks. That's just not fair and it's not safe that we put people on it, that, that this is a profession, that people will invest in not just their dollars, but their time and being safe, being accessible, understanding the dynamics of this city and being able to serve the people of this city. And it's unfair that people show up with no training, no understanding, and they're able to take business and money from the, out of the mouths of these families here. And we as a city can do better. Any response? Um, I want to point out that the, the point you made about the difference between what someone has to do to drive a taxi versus what they have to do to drive um, an app in an app-based service or for any car service um, being different. That is true up until about 2015 when we instituted training for all drivers. So now every driver has to go through the 24-hour training, the sex trafficking training, the wheelchair accessible training, they all, and they always all had to do the fingerprinting, DMV, criminal background, and the FHV drivers now have to also do the medical, which taxi always had to do as well. So we, and, and with the help of the Transportation Committee, we've created one license. So in that sense, we have given a lot of mobility for drivers and for owners who are recruiting drivers to get drivers, any one of the 172,000 dr licensed drivers they can all use. It is different for commuter van, um, and I know that's a, an area of, particular concern for you with respect to recruiting drivers um, because they have to meet state standards, um, 19A standards. Uh, so it's, it's a state requirement, but we're happy to work with you to see if there are ways that um, we can broaden the pool for commuter van drivers because I know that is of concern and the commuter vans, the legal commuter vans are the lifeline of your neighborhoods. Has, has there been anything to, done to address this, this new uh, chariot uh, company? Chariot, that has yeah, it, you know, we, we've talked a lot, we know a lot about the commuter van issues from our discussions and meetings, and chariot came in as a black car company. Um, so they did not come in as a commuter van company. Uh, we will keep you posted on the amount of activity. But what are they? They are a black car company. What are they? Are they commuter vans? Are they vans? Are they black cars? The, black, the definition of black car has Are they has 15 passenger coming. vans or are they black cars? 
A black car is anything now. A black car can be a green car. I mean, that's See, where that's we exactly are. why we find ourselves in the position today that we in, because this is, this is not just that we're being ambiguous. Definition we're, of we're the black allowing, car, if that needs we to be defined. We absolutely need to define, as a matter of fact, who is who and what is what, so that we can take charge of this, so that we can protect the, 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 the livelihood of, of folks, that we can't have industries. No, 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 we don't do that. That we can't have people, corporations coming from outside of New York City and taking over industries and just moving people out of jobs. That's, that's so we'd be happy to work with city council where the definitions in the ad code of black car Lux Limo live. Um, and if there needs to be further work on clarifying and refining those, we're happy to work with you These on These guys this. have come in and they've pretty much without everything that we worked years on regulating those commuter vans and whether or not they were usurping MTA, whether they were operating safe, accessible, they, they don't have to do any of that. So we spend all that time in here, they're going to knock these guys out of the industry and now we spend another four years trying to regulate them. And I do, well, we're on the topic of, the of commuter vans. I do want to report that we have um, rolled out our forfeiture program that began December 2016, and we've done quite a lot of work on the illegal commuter vans. We've seen yes, about we 15, and we don't give them back. They now we got these guys. Forfeiture. <laughs> so, thank you. You are. Councilmember Greenfield. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chair and Commissioner, for your testimony today. I, I just um, just want to clarify a couple of things. The when we talk about the um, traditionally the role of the TLC, do you see it as part of your mandate or role to try to protect the investment of the medallions? Obviously, many folks, many of them who are here today, they've invested their life savings, and this is perhaps their one largest asset that they. Own. Is that something that you view as part of your mandate, or where, do, where, do you, where does your agency figure into that equation? Aside from the standard, we, know, we all know what it is that you do in terms of technically what the TLC does and the rules and the regulations and the oversight, but do you, do you view that as part of your mandate to try to protect the value of these medallions? So I, I, we view our mandate as that that stems from the charter, which says we protect and we do transportation policy that affects drivers, public transportation, passengers, and the businesses that operate within it, which, within that. Um, there is lots of litigation about the exact question that you've asked me on what exactly are those, the meaning of those charter phrases. So I will decline to comment further on that because that's happening through litigation. But generally, we defer to the charter, and the courts are now going to decide what the <clears throat> charter really encompasses or not. Okay, so without, for those of us like myself who are not uh, familiar with the intimate details of that litigation, without saying something that would impact on litigation, you must have a position. So what is the TLC position as to what, what your role is in terms of the value of those medallions? Our role is to make sure that the public and those who operate have good service. And from good service flows revenue, and from revenue flows increased values. So the consequence of good service is increased values. And we really want to focus our efforts in making sure that there are good cars out on the road, that there's efficient ways for passengers to get them, that drivers are qualified to drive them, and all of that adds up to revenue, which increases value. So you have to start with service when you're deciding what value is. That's the perspective that um, we have here at the TLC. Okay, I guess let me ask you differently. Is, there, is, it, is it fair to say that as part of uh, service, having a rider owner who was invested in the medallion, who's been there for years, who continues to drive, that that might be something that would benefit the, the industry and that perhaps the falling values of the medallions might be having a negative impact on the ability and dedication and commitment to do this as a long-term prospect, which many people have done over historically for years? The declining values are surely having an incredible negative aspect impact on those individual owners. Um, but I think you're right. We, we sub have long supported um, the owner-driver model because it does what I um, referred to in my testimony. 
the owner driver is invested in every part of that process. Their car is clean because they drive it every day. They're um, dependent on the fares because the fares determine how much er of their earnings they get to take home. They're not in the garage model where they're siloed payments like lease cap payments and monthly medallion lump sum payments. And so they are the epitome of the, of the smart business strategy. Um, today's, today's values are certainly hurting them because the loans that are attached to those medallions that they did work very hard for and have earned income on for many years um, are not able to meet the loans that they're due every month. Sure, I guess what, what, what I'm really getting at, which is even more specific, is that it, we're now discouraging right, a whole generation of individuals who might have gone into this business or this industry to take it in, as a, a serious potential business opportunity from participating because essentially the message to them is that the values of these medallions are declining and we're not going to step in to help you with your investment. Do you see my concern from that perspective? I, I think um, I think I see your concern. It's like, what is the model going forward? And we see this phenomenon not just in the taxi industry. You can look at Amazon or Walmart or so many of these companies that are now operating in large scale that make it extremely difficult sure, for small because, businesses. Because and because I'm running I think out of that's time. a microcosm of what's happening here in the that's taxi fair. industry. That's fair. But, Commissioner, to be fair, we in the city didn't sell contracts to those stores, for example, that were selling electronics, giving them some sort of exclusivity over the electronic business, where we did essentially to the taxi medallion world saying, hey, you're going to have an exclusive, and in return for this exclusive, you're going to pay a premium, right? So if I decided that I'm going to open up David's electronic shop, I didn't pay a city agency a premium for that. I just simply opened up David's electronic shop. Now Amazon came and put me out of business. That's fair. But if I paid the city a premium so that I could be the only person who sells electronics at 250 Broadway, and now someone else is selling electronics at 250 Broadway, well, that's, I think it's a fair question as to what role the city should be playing in that. But I, I, I'm out of time, so I just want to ask one final question. Are there any lessons to be learned from London's actions with Uber? I'm sure you've seen the news recently yes, where London stepped in. <laughs> what, uh, what's your assessment of that, and how do you think that relates to uh, to New York City in a very different model, obviously. Right here in New York, there was a lot of pressure. It seems like the city backed off. And then in London, you have a model where there's a lot of pressure, and it seems the city just said, well, we're shutting you down. So what, what do you learn? London's another major metropolitan city. We always like to compare ourselves here yes. to London. So what, what uh, they have better accents, of course, but what <laughs> uh, do you view as the lessons from the London model, and how does it apply to the TLC and your relationship with Uber and the other similar kinds of companies? Um, so we, we did have the opportunity to speak to Lon Transport for London to get some better understanding of what's happening there. Um, the license was not renewed. Uh, should Uber appeal that decision, they continue to operate. It, that includes adding drivers and adding vehicles while that case is pending through the courts, which they estimate could take three years. So there's no immediate change on the ground for Uber unless they decide not to appeal, in which case they would be shut down immediately. Some of the concerns that they had are ones that we address in our backgrounding process. Um, it sounded like they didn't and they didn't have confidence in this, the agencies that Uber was using to vet drivers. Here in New York, we vet those drivers ourselves. We do are in charge of the fingerprinting and the DMV. Um, they were also concerned about Uber's involvement generally in gray balling, um, and their transport for London is a little bit different than TLC because it works at sort of state, local, and federal levels. Here, the inquiry into gray balling is the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice, and that's an active open investigation, my understanding. Um, and should we get information from DOJ, um, we would absolutely take action. So are there any lessons to be learned from their interaction? with um, Uber in London? Is there any takeaways I mean, from your it's very similar. They're facing, uh, it's similar in, in the sense that they, um, the Uber is in their for hire sector um, just like it is in 
hours. They call it private hire there. Um, they have uh, a little less information about how their taxis and Ubers operate within the city. Um, but I, I can't say at this early stage that there is, there is a lesson, and I also would like to see a little bit more fleshed out about the reasons for the non-renewal, um, which I think will be forthcoming as the case gets litigated. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Greenfield. We're going to do a second round, but being that I am <laughs> sitting in the chair seat, I'm going to take a privilege and, and kind of stay on that. But you talked about delivery of services, but we want to talk about the consistency of that, whether or not they're being delivered the same and, and uh, uh, throughout the industries. And some folks, uh, as you said, and, and I don't want to uh, uh, stick on the commuter vans, but, but just those who are providing transportation um, throughout the city, um, as we have uh, uh, folks who, who have purchased medallions, we also have folks who have historically have franchising rights. And these uh, uh, Walmarts or, or others that come, corporations that now come in and, and, and sort of just, just uh, uh, circumvent that franchising. I, they, they just stop anywhere they want to stop and pick up anywhere they want to pick up. Uh, that is, that seems to be problematic. And it seems that the city is saying that there is not consistency in services, but it also, it, to me, would appear that we are abdicating our responsibility as a municipality to ensure that all of our citizens have safe and accessible transportation and equitable transportation, no matter where you are in the city. If you don't have the ability to regulate folks, then you can't ensure that. And if you allow people to come in and, and think you're gonna regulate them after the fact, then we have a problem. Whereas we could kind of foresee all the app-based um, participation that is coming in and to the industry. One of my, again, I, I would like to say also is that Safety should be our paramount concern, and whether or not 24-hour online is equivalent to the services that, that folks are being trained, being retrained um, consistently based on what industry that they are in, whether or not this is a requirement of those who are entering the industry, and how do we ensure that these things occur. First, that you're not impeding on those who have invested in franchises, that we are not impeding on those who invested in, and, and certainly um, those who have invested in medallions as well. As, as the uh, council member said, that, that we do believe that those who have invested life savings here in this city should be protected by that. That's the agreement that, that they entered into. Right, that this has a certain value, that value being assessed and determined by a government entity. That we should know that there's going to be able to sustain that value, at least for the foreseeable future, not two years later decreased by 90%. And we're just throwing our hands up saying, well, it's okay. And continuing to allow people to, to uh, come into the industry. So, um, I would hope that we can do better by that. And you did talk about working with the council. And certainly, we have uh, a, a plethora of ideas that I think that uh, could be, could be um, helpful. But if the admin is going to take the uh, position that these are job creators, as what occurred in the past, then that is counterproductive. It really is. I remember doing a hearing and these people were promising that they were going to create 10,000 jobs, $50,000 a year and all these other things and the average driver now drives less than 20 hours a week. And we have five times as many cars on the road. We missed something there. So I hope it can be better. Uh, Councilman Grudinchik. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what to call you, <laughs> the DM chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, this is an administration that seems to enjoy regulating every aspect of life 
in the city of New York, including areas where many mayors have uh, failed to uh, wander into before. And yet I don't get a sense of urgency. I appreciate your being here today, but you know, I have many constituents, my colleagues here also have many constituents who are in danger of losing their homes, um, losing their livelihoods. The value of medallions have dropped nearly 90%, depending on how you count. But I don't see a sense of urgency here from the city in rectifying this problem. I don't mean to suggest that the city of New York should prop up the market artificially. But I also don't mean to suggest that we wring our hands and say there's nothing that we can do about it. And I want to know whether or not, I, I've been reading your, the back page of your testimony here, and I, I don't get a sense whether you even support this legislation, because you didn't really answer the question. I think we said we support the legislation as long as the advisory board that um, is a consequence of the legislation includes vital participants. And I think Chair Rodriguez started out um, correctly in, in noting the ways that we could expand it so that the drivers and medallion owners and lending institutions are part of the conversation. Um, we'd be happy to discuss with you if there is um, a, a, an action that can be taken that can quickly reverse things. Um, that's something that we'd, we'd love to discuss with you. Many of the quick things, the, th the deadlines that are upon people that are crushing them are their bank loan deadlines. Um, and that, we've met with the banks. Um, I've given them my non-banking suggestion that they write off the loans and they let people borrow it at rates that, and sizes that make sense for those borrowing them given today's market conditions because having a borrower that can pay you something is better than having a borrower that can't pay you anything but I don't have any jurisdiction over them, but I'm more than happy to make my views known to them. And you have a lot of owner drivers that this is their life, so they do want to continue to drive a taxi. Um, it's, it's about the medallion value, but it's also about their profession. Um, and, and that would allow them to continue to do that. There is precedent, not in the taxi and limousine industry, but many years ago when I worked for former Borough President Claire Shulman, uh, she didn't have the authority, but she worked out co-op and condo at the, at the depths of the 80s and, and early 90s at the worst of the co-op and condo crisis. Uh, bank, I can remember, I believe the number was $18 million that the Bank of Tokyo alone ate on a loan on the Acropolis, um, which I believe is either in Costa Constantinese District or Jimmy Van Bramer's District. So there is precedent for this. Well, that's um, heartening to know. What? That is very heartening to know. And, and I will tell you, she had absolutely, you can look through the entire city charter, you can hold it up to, uh, to, the, to the light. There is absolutely nothing granting the Borough President of Queens the right to work out co-op and condo uh, settlements. And yet she did, and she saved the apartments, the family homes of 20,000 families, saving at least 50,000 people from being homeless. And the best part of it was we also saved them from they would have still owed the money, their share of the underlying mortgage, so it would have been a total disaster. And while maybe we can't do that here, but I'm sure there are things that we can, we can do, um, the thing that I really would like to hear progress on, and I think is perhaps the best avenue um, in the amount of time that I've spent studying this issue, is the Accessoride issue. Um, I get a lot of complaints about Accessoride, my colleagues get a lot of complaints about it. And sadly, we do not have uh, that oversight here uh, that we would like to have over it, even though it affects New York City residents. So I think if we could marry the, the yellow cabs especially and the green cabs, uh, which are handicap accessible, to uh, the clients, the people that, that we are elected to represent, to those cabs, um, give them an app. It might be even worthwhile to give them you know, a relatively cheap smartphone and teach them how to use it just to get that ball rolling. So I would appreciate an update on that when you have more information. Sure, the MTA has told us that they are looking to produce an app that their customers can use. Um, and as I, I mentioned before, we've worked for over two years now very closely with the MTA to get them to integrate yellow and green taxis into their Accessoride program. So we were very happy that a few months ago they voted to do a pilot um, allowing apps that, you, that work through yellow and green taxis to provide accessoride rides, and that's now happening and at least a thousand a day. And there's room to grow there, we know that. I would think there's a lot of room to grow, and I, I think it would be a wonderful thing, you know, especially 
uh, for the, it would be a wonderful thing. It's a symbiotic relationship. It'd be great for the people who use Accessoride. It would also be great for the people who have invested their hard-earned dollars in City of New York uh, taxi medallions. That's our goal. Thank you very much, You're Commissioner. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Well, you heard from my colleagues, and we will hear from the medallion owners and from the industry. This is a crisis that is affecting our city. I remember when I joined the council in 2009, and we get the briefing for our budget, the line of revenue coming from the yellow taxi was there in large number. In the last few years, we are in zero when it comes to the revenue that the city is able to collect because they sell the medallions. So I think that, you know, this is not only, you know, a crisis that is affecting those 6,000 individual medallion owners, the private sector also who invest uh, in the corporation, but this is also the city is losing millions and millions of dollars because we are not able to raise those revenue and those money are needed to keep expanding our firehouse and for up the school program. So, you know, this is, I just feel that we are against the clock. Can we turn, you know, this crisis back? We require, you know, a lot. Uh, we have seen what is happening in London, right? We've got to learn from what happened. You know, the traditional taxi industry, they also being organized because they feel that the way of how the other player came to the country was not fair for the traditional one. And that's what I always will be advocating working for. Level the playing field for everyone so that everyone have, should have a fair shop in order to make their living, get a, a return from the investors and get be able to keep the house, to pay the mortgage. But you talk about that now, the definition of black car is something that is not there. I remember when I, you know, when I used to work in this area washing dishes, uh, food concert restaurant, uh, people who used to work in the private sector, when they talk about a black car, the black car should be institution and we have met with many of them, having a fami family business, people being able to maintain, build and maintain the black car industry for generations. But they used to have an account with those companies that they provide the services to. So, and that group is there. So how many vehicles do you think do we have right now in the street of New York that are not that traditional black car that they provide the services based on agreement in, uh, with you know the providers and the clients going to pick up because they have a bank account. Like how many of those cars do we have there? It is the question how many vehicles do I think are doing app-based trips? Yeah, with okay. the, well, as, as you say, with a new black car that is not a traditional black car. Right, um, and the definition for the black car in the ad code is, is simply that they do 90% of their work non-cash. Um, so I think we're at least 70,000 vehicles. And there's no limitation, right? There's no limitation. Yes. Impact. Correct. Like, like, what is TLC doing or make, what is the assessment that you've been able to make when it comes to that reality that we're facing today? Well, I think one assessment, and I think this was, really came out of our April hearing, is with this kind of oversaturation, it's harder and harder for drivers to make a living. They're either not getting the amount of work that they used to get in the past, or with a reduction in prices for passengers, they are also seeing a reduction in prices and fares. So that is something that we're looking into in earnest, because on the yellow taxi side, we do have protections for drivers in terms of pay in the form of the lease cap. But the oversaturation of vehicles is surely having a detrimental effect on the drivers um, that are in the market today. But the oversaturation 
is only for coming from one side of the industry. It's because it's in the, the yellow, they don't have. Sector. They don't have. They don't have the flexibility. Excuse me. I say the yellow taxi industry. They don't have any flexibility to add an additional car, because we, by law, is sitting a state. We limit on the number of vehicles. Right. However, we don't have any cap on how many livery or black car we are giving licenses today. That's correct. And and I hope again that you know that we can address it. Do you think that we should have a cap? Uh, as I said to Council Member Chin, um, it's important to make decisions with information. And I think um, Council Member Chin m made a good point. You know, let's see where these cars are operating. Are they operating in places where there's already um, ample transportation? Um, are, are, they, are they operating in areas where they are also competing with buses and other forms of public transportation? Or are they operating in the outer boroughs where we have transportation deserts and they're vital parts to people's daily commute and getting to social functions? And those kind of finer questions, I think, need to be examined before there's a decision made on what, if any, action you take going forward. But um, now that I've got a deadline from Council Member Chin to have that information to you in the next few months, um, I think we'll be in a better position to, to see what the next move is. How many yellow taxi are they ready to provide services for individuals with wheelchair? Uh, today we have 1,800 yellow taxis that are accessible. How many green? Uh, we have we have about 800 green taxis that are accessible. How many permits do you have for green that you have not been able to sell because there has not been a demand from the market? I'll have to get that number for you, but we are on tranche two, so we have the whole third tranche. If you remember, there were 18,000 issued, um, and we've only gone through the first one and part of the second one, so we have more than half of them still available. Some of them have come back, so they're available again. And the number 18,000 was set by state law. Um, you know, it, I don't know if it represents the market, but the fact that we have only sold about half of them shows um, a, a sort of decline in people's interest in that as an investment. Many of these questions are related to the role that I see the commission in playing, the task force. I just want for us to start thinking about those questions. How can we incentivize those green, potential green taxi driver that they can buy the permit. The sector, the yellow taxi, that they already can use a, a accessible vehicle. But there's a market or a sector, right, that is there, that is around half a million billion dollars. There's a need that the black card, a responsibility that they should have. Can we work together to centralize the services, you know, for individuals in wheelchair to be able to say, here we have those three additional 3,000 green taxi that they can be available. There's another 1,000 of vehicle from the yellow taxi industry, but can we hope to build that market, you know, by working with the MTA and be able to make this group the central core. I think that the father now, there's like some pilot project, but is everyone trying to take a piece? No, Especially for the MTA pilot project, yes. there's um, one participant, and I believe in the near future there'll be a second taxi participant. Um, so I, th I think we'll end up with two participants in the taxi sector. It's open to FHVs, but there's been no FHV participant yet. Is Uber part of that pilot project? Excuse me? Uber, is Uber part of that pilot project? No, it's not. At no level, they are not involved? Um, there, there is only one company that is allowed to pilot it today, and that is the Curb app and Verifone. Okay. I, again, like, you know, you've been a partner in this conversation, but I think, again, that we have failed. I mean, we, the city, lied to this industry. 
And I think this is like the housing crisis. People buying houses in Florida and other places. And then later on, they found out that they didn't have the, the real price value. And I think that this is the time, this is the time for us. Like, for me, it's on, I don't get it, Commissioner. You talk about that there's like a close to 100,000 new apps company that they are not the traditional black car industry, that they have, you know, a bank account agreements with the institution that they represent in the black car. Talking about those that they are trying to get the passenger from the Earth, the JFK in LaGuardia, that they are waiting for that market there. They are the one who also get into services in the Midtown area. Like, when can we have a plan to say this is zero tolerance, translated in action or enforcing against those individuals <laughs> You know, taking the food away from those people who invested hundred thousand of dollars in those drivers that as immigrants as we are, they rely on that industry to say we can make a living. So you know, for me this is about this crisis is so big, we need to act, we have to come together, and I think that we have to send the message. And too many like having like an open a, a uh, numbers of people getting new cars from anybody else except yellow taxi. I know saying that we have to be making the number the same as the, as the other industry. But I think that we have to have a limit on how many of those people, how many cars those uh, uh, new uh, company that now they call a black car, that they're not. And we have to describe, we have to come out with a definition of what a black car industry is. So, but, you know, I hope that we can work together with this and many others. If my colleague has any other questions, Margaret? No, no. No? Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thanks. Going to be calling the first two panels. Is one is medallion owners, and the second is, and please, the first group, only if you own a medallion, come to this group. If you don't, don't come to this group. Lucio Rizio. Sergio Cabrera, Caroline Protz, Nino Hernes. Yeah, but I'm going to call him the next group. He doesn't know the medallion. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry. We put in the next group together. The drivers, the owners, this, these are the big owners. That's the first group. They represent the industry. They don't own it. Yeah. You can put it together. He represents. Okay. Okay. okay, we were going to we put in a clock in three minutes. Quiet down, please. Please quiet down. Uh, just to be clear, this panel is only pleased by medallion owners. If you represent that industry, we're going to be calling you in the next group. If you sit in there, it's because you own a medallion. El sector que está aquí son personas que son dueños de medallones. I don't know if the couple also. Uh, señor, ¿Usted quiere testificar ahora? Por favor. I will be calling the next representative of another group. This group is the medallion owners. I will, I will call in the next group. Okay, uh, you're going to be having three minutes, so if you take longest, please summarize. Should we begin? Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Carolyn Prats, and I am an individual medallion owner. I never thought in a million years that I was going to have to come down to the city council and beg for my life and the lives of my colleagues, but indeed that's what I'm here to do today. 
Something that has been lost in the discussion, I think, is that you, New York City government, are our partners. And we, being part of New York City's public transportation system, are your partners. And being a partner does have certain obligations. We follow the rules, and you protect the franchise we purchased. This isn't a market. We purchased the franchise. An entire cohort of citizens of New York, the individual medallion owner and their families, which amount to about 30,000 people, have been plucked out of the middle class and plunked down into the depths of poverty. You have the power and indeed the duty to remedy this dire situation. And I thank you for this first step, creating this task force to raise and stabilize medallion values. To us, the medallion represents not some esoteric part of a diversified portfolio of investment funds, but the sum total of a man or working woman's life. In remedying this situation, you will also help the city to maintain the revenue stream which we have provided to the city, as you've pointed out, over the years. As Senator Everett Dirksen used to say, a billion here and a billion there, pretty soon you're talking real money. And New York City has lost a lot of money already. In addition to the $2 billion in lost medallion sales, there has been a loss of $100 million in the last year due to lost fees, including MTA and TIF fees. Before the multinational, multi-billion dollar app company invasion, there were 38,000 for hire vehicles licensed by the TLC. There are now 110,000. Commissioner Zoshi has said that there will be 35,000 more this year, and this has all occurred without any environmental study. And let's face it, no matter where these cars are, and I don't think you need to do a study to tell you where they are, they're all causing pollution. And that's a tremendous problem. Also, keep in mind that the demand for rides is relatively static, and that is the crux of the problem. There are simply more vehicles out there chasing after the same number of passengers in terrible traffic, lowering income for black, yellow, green, and livery drivers, and the value of the franchise we purchased, the medallion. Think of it this way. If there's a million trips a day and 100,000 vehicles, that's 10 trips a day per vehicle. That's insane. A taxi is supposed to do about 60 trips a day. That's an efficient use of a vehicle. 10 trips a day is not an efficient use. Um, to Council Member Miller, who I see isn't here, he was talking about safety. One of the consequences of having 110,000 vehicles out there is a tremendous increase in crashes. Black car crashes have gone from 500 a month in 2014 to 2,800 a month in 2017. That's a staggering increase of 426% in crashes. And let's face it, that's mostly due to distracted driving. App drivers have three of these and the GPS. They're often an inexperienced drivers. I'm sure that has something to do with it. The mayor, the city council, and DOT have all stated the goals of decreasing congestion, pollution, accidents, while encouraging the use of public transportation. Well, at the same time, the TLC is pumping out a seemingly unlimited number of for hire vehicles. To someone outside of government, this seems insane. And it seems like it's time for you to step up to the plate, and I think that's what you want to do, and legislate responsibly. We look forward to continuing the conversation on how to accomplish the goal of stabilizing the value of the medallion so necessary to New York City and to the working class immigrants who put their trust in you to do the right thing. Thank you. Before we continue, is anyone here from TLC? Okay. No, no. Thank you. you know, I would like to put my, our staff of the council to be sure that we contact TLC and to let them know that we expect for them to leave someone here so that they can listen for the testimony here. No clapping, no clapping, please. Just respect our signs. Good afternoon, uh, Transportation Committee. Thank you for listening to us, uh, to Council Member Rodriguez and the whole Transportation Committee. You've been a staunch supporter since the beginning, since the original cap 
was introduced and if 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 the 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 times are anything but telling we can see that we were right in trying to limit these taxis because now we've created a situation where the nightmare has come true. We're all at a race. We're all on the race to the bottom. Our industry is in a free fall, and the TLC has failed us. The TLC claims that they need numbers and they need data. They have all this. We were doing 500,000 plus trips in 2012, 13,000 cabs doing 500,000 trips. Right now, the FHVs, the app companies, they're doing about 300,000 rides, but they have 70,000 vehicles. This number should give enough data to say we don't need that many vehicles on the road, period. Um, as Council Member Gradenchik was saying, where is the urgency? This, the TLC has no urgency. They've allowed this to fester and to become something that's uncontrollable. And now they state that they have no um, way of stopping it. And that's not true. A simple um, swipe of the pen will control this whole industry again. In 2012, we knew where green cabs, well, we knew where livery cabs were, we knew where black cars were, we knew what yellow cabs uh, were. Everyone had a purpose. This administration has just allowed it to snowball into something um, that's um, not understandable, and they use this as an excuse not to um, act. And we need someone to take control. What's the reason why all these numbers are uh, all these numbers are off the board? They undercut. The TLC has never allowed anyone to use meters in anything that's not a traditional yellow cab and now the green cab, and they have never allowed anyone to surge price. When you have these factors added to the whole equation. It's an unfair, unregulated, competitive advantage that they have, and the yellow cabs have nowhere and no one to um, run to. Uh, there's so much to talk about. I hope that we, as individual medallion owners, are not left out of the conversation for trying to get this industry back to where it was. The number one thing that we need to gain is confidence. The confidence in our industry has been lost. The investor is not there anymore. The banks are not there anymore. And we need confidence to be brought back to the table so that we can have a new generation of uh, investors and cab drivers and professional people to take care of this city. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can you repeat your name? My name is Sergio Cabrera. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Chair uh, of Transportation, Elena Rodriguez, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Uh, what, what I have seen and listening uh, throughout these last two years, besides the decimation of our industry, it is also the lack of understanding or the two fundamental principles that make the difference between a yellow cab and FHVs. The yellow cab, we do a street hail, but a street hail is, is, is a word that has a foundation, and the foundation that gives the meaning is service on demand. We were the only one giving up service on them, giving out service, service on demand, and no one else. And those rights have been given away to this new uh, apps company right now, which are competing against us totally unfair. So when the Tax Limousine Commission recognized e hail as a prearranged, when in fact they are giving on-demand service, I mean, it's, it's total, total misleading to the public and to you. 
So th that's the reason why I always keep saying that regulators have to understand those principles. The next principle that we have is the use of meters. Meters actually uh, set the fares by the Tax and Machine Commission does not allow us to any kind of sur uh, search price. And now they, they have allowed the apps companies to use virtual meters, which it was unthinkable back then. And the reason why they didn't use it back then is because the Tax and Machine Commission, they do not set the fares of FHVs. They cannot regulate them, therefore they were never allowed to use it. They're doing it now. Now, we are here discussing to the, what we are here are the same values that uh, the New York City uh, goes along with. Uh, for the interest of the people, I mean, the New York City values always uh, preach that the interest of the people come before the interest of multi-billion dollar scam corporation. Well, what we are discussing goes along with Vision Zero also, which is the primary mission of the government to protect the people. Therefore, solving traffic congestion, minimizing pollution, stopping gouging, and giving the same option of transportation to our disabled, it is the right thing to do. There's, two, there's urgency in our industry right now where we see probably over a thousand individual medallion owners, we lose their medallions and we need the action from you and from the taxi commission to do something about it. Thank you very much. Marcelino Hervias, well known as Nino. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Gloria Guerra. I'm here on behalf of all the taxi medallion owners. I'm an individual owner. We need to act now. I plead, we're going down. And we're going down faster than ever now. As a medallion owner, there's no one that wants to drive the yellow industry. Why would I, why would I even consider buying a medallion right now when I could do the same type of work in a nice black car? And the commissioner says she needs a statistic. She just has to walk out of her office and she'll see Uber all around. It doesn't take Einstein to see it. We need action now. And if we don't get it now, this is a disaster. Because right now, time is against me and my husband. We don't have any more time to wait. They have to act now. They sold us a franchise, and they better step up to the platter. And if she could stand here, why is Uber above the law? Uber could change their prices. We can't change the prices. Uber could buy whatever car they want. Uber doesn't have to get a wheelchair accessibility. Why is Uber above the law? Why? I want someone to answer that to me. How can they come into this city and migrate and take over? They didn't create jobs. They took our jobs, our hard earning blood. My husband worked for 35 years. He doesn't have the energy to do it anymore. We should be retired. I shouldn't be sitting here. I should be drinking margarita in Florida because I thought we did the right thing. We paid, we played by the rules, we worked, we did everything right. And now we're getting punished by the city of New York because we trusted them. What are we living in, a communist? Where they come and take over all your stuff that you worked so hard for so many years? This is not what American is. At least that's not what my dad thought when he, we immigrated here from Cuba. He said, this is the land of a dream, and I had a dream, and my dream has been taken away, and I don't have any more time. I can't wait for the commissioner to think and do a statistic. The statistics are right there in front of her. She just doesn't want to see it, and she manipulates every little question, but she said something that got to me. She says, every customer has the right to take their first choice of cab. What did she just say? The first choice of cab should be a yellow car, not an Uber. That's all I have to say. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and you know, we're going to be listening to all the voices. And as we said before, uh, we are committed to continue. I will do my part to save this industry. So if you're ready to fight and organize and work together, here you have an ally because I believe it is unfair. You know, that we fail not only to those four of you, but to the large numbers of hardworking New Yorkers also that believe in the same dream that Gloria has. Thank you now, we're calling to the next group. Next group, Ethan, Elbow. Peter Mazer, Arthur Goldson, David Pollack, Cassandra Perez, Thank you, Council Member. Um, I want to thank you, Council Member Rodriguez, for calling this very, very important uh, hearing today. Um, I do want to address, before I do in my prepared remarks, um, just a couple of things the Commissioner did say. Um, one of the questions that was asked, I think, by Council Member Greenfield was whether it's part of the Charter, or what are the, what are, whether it's part of her duties to protect the medallion owner. Um, and I didn't really understand the answer. So I quickly ran outside and Googled the city charter and the TLC rules. And in about 30 seconds, I found that uh, TLC rule 52-044 says it's part of the TLC's duties to establish and enforce standards to ensure all licensees are and remain financially stable. It's right there in the TLC rules. My name is Ethan Gerber. I'm an attorney with Abrams Fensterman. I represent many large taxi fleets and many individual owners. I also own a few medallions myself. In order to understand the medallion industry, you need to go back in time a little bit. During the Great Depression, any person with a car could be a cab driver. Even though it was far harder to get a car in the Depression than it is today, the streets were flooded with cabs. Drivers fought each other for fares. No one was able to earn a living. In 1937, your predecessors created the medallion system. They limited the number of medallions. This was done to benefit the drivers and enable them to earn a living. As time went on, every once in a while, the city would increase the number of medallions, always conducting a study to determine the economic and environmental impact more cars would have on the road. A few years ago, this all changed. Technology in the TLC allowed a hail to be done electronically rather than been lifting a hand. The effect is the same. We had streets flooded with 70,000 new vehicles. It's important to note that a for-hire vehicle is not the same as a passenger vehicle. When I commute to work, I take a parked car, drive to work, and park it. A for-hire vehicle is on the road constantly. Some estimates say that for one hire vehicle is the same as 30 private vehicles. The streets are flooded. Don't take my word for it. You don't really need a study. Go outside and count the vehicles with the letter T at the beginning of their plate. These are for-hire vehicles, and they are everywhere. Drivers can no longer earn a living. Uber is not an efficient model because in order to have a, a car within a few minutes, there has to be literally tens of thousands of empty vehicles on the road not earning a living. This industry was created by this body. This body, together with the New York State Legislature, authorized the auctions of New York City medallions, and the New York City Tax and Limousine Commission promoted the sale of medallions, giving out flyers, handing out material, touting the great investment potential to medallion taxi cabs. Thousands of the buyers of these cabs, many relatively low-income people, many of them immigrants, trusted New York City and invested in New York City by buying these medallions. 
Over the last three years, these trusting New Yorkers saw their life savings destroyed, while the City Council and TLC nothing to help them. The City sat while a gigantic multi-billion dollar California-based conglomerate called these thousands of owners a monopoly. While they willingly broke laws all over the world, they labeled taxi owners a cartel. Unfortunately, some here and many bought the deluge of advertising and lobbying that allowed that twisted message. So now the genie's out of the bottle, what can we do? The New York City medallion industry is the most regulated industry in New York. The TLC tells us the price structure for our fares, the lease structure for our drivers. They dictate what our contract must look like, even what vehicles we're allowed to own. Uber and Lyft, on the other hand, are left to their own devices. The TLC requires half our vehicles be wheelchair accessible. There is no such requirement for Uber and Lyft. We are required to have ample parking so that our cars do not clog every available parking space. There is no such requirement for Uber and Lyft. We are required to have partitions in our vehicle. Partitions stop the communication between passengers and driver and interfere with air conditioning flow. There is no such requirement for Uber or Lyft. Our passengers are required to pay a 50 cent surcharge for the MTA. There is no such requirement for Uber or Lyft. We were sold an exclusive right. We paid millions of dollars for that right. We filled the city coffers with billions from auctions. We employed thousands of New Yorkers, not just drivers, but dispatchers, mechanics, office staff, and others needed for New York City brick and mortar companies. Now these rights are given away for free. If we, do not have, if we do have to compete with Uber or Lyft, let them have the same standards as us. Either tighten their regulations or loosen ours. Second, limit the number of vehicles. There are too many on the road. Set a cap. Not only is this good for the industries and congestion, it is essential for the environment. Another thing that the city can do is promote the New York City taxi cab. We have wonderful apps. These apps like Curb and Arrow make hailing a taxi as e easy as hailing an Uber or Lyft. We even have an app, Lacus, that saves drivers time and money by being able to get a cab without going to a garage. The city has done nothing to promote those apps. The tens of thousands of individual owners cannot individually afford to advertise, especially now that many of them are forced into bankruptcy. The city can do this. Members of this council, the city made a promise to medallion owners and drivers. Spend your money, get this exclusive right. You raised that money and that exclusive right was given away. Now is the time to earn the trust of these hardworking men and women placed in you and backed up with their hard-earned money. Thank you. And before we hear from the next person, I, will, I would like to acknowledge that there is a representative here from the mayor's office. So when we ask about TLC, even though they didn't raise their hand, but there's someone from the mayor's office sitting. Good, good afternoon, Council Member Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. My name is Peter Mazur and I am General Counsel to the Metropolitan Taxi Care Board of Trade. We represent the owners and operators of more than 5,500 licensed medallion taxi cabs. Thank you for holding this hearing today and giving me the opportunity to discuss the current crisis in the medallion taxi cab industry. Medallion values have plummeted since 2013. Indeed, it is very difficult to accurately determine the value of a medallion now since there are very few transactions and virtually no financing available. But this is not the first time medallion prices have fallen dramatically. Between 1998 and 2001, medallion values fell by a third, primarily because there was a lack of confidence in the health of the industry. At the time, the city adopted a series of regulations to improve service to customers and professionalize the industry. These reforms included mandatory drug testing, criminal background checks, and programs to track drivers who committed multiple driving offenses. Taxi care bonus had new insurance requirements and mandatory retirement of vehicles. Over time, the industry embraced these changes, service improved, and there was renewed confidence in the health of the taxi cab industry, which was ultimately reflected in higher medallion values. Medallion values continued to rise until 2013, primarily because of the confidence in the industry by owners and drivers, and because lenders provided financing for both purchase of medallions as well as refinancing to further invest in the medallion industry. This level of confidence has eroded over the past four years. More individuals are licensed by the TLC, but fewer of these individuals are driving yellow cabs. Medallions are now routinely placed in storage by owners or are being foreclosed upon by lenders. This never happened in the past. Ridership is down and there is pessimism throughout all segments of the industry. But there is also many encouraging signs. While crashes involving black cars have skyrocketed, yellow cabs have fewer crashes per mile than just about any other form of transportation. 
I submit that the TLC reforms have worked to make taxis safer. Driving o driving driver earnings within the yellow industry is still healthy. Hour for hour, taxi cab drivers earn more than other for hire vehicle drivers. And despite over 100,000 for hire vehicles on the road versus less than 14,000 yellow cabs, every day more than 300,000 individuals still place their hands in the air, walk to a hack stand, or use an app to ride yellow. So we have a lot to be proud of. The City Council and the TLC has worked with this industry to make necessary legal and regulatory changes, and we applaud your efforts to support the taxi cab industry. I believe there are a few areas that we have not yet tackled, and we look forward to working with you on each one of these. One is vehicle choice. The medallion industry is burdened with the expensive, unreliable, gas-guzzling NV200 as a mandated vehicle, while four hire vehicle operators can place into service any vehicle their drivers and passengers want. The City Council mandated a limited hybrid option, but there needs to be more done to provide vehicle choice for the medallion industry. Furthermore, it is the medallion industry that provides the bulk of the city's demand responsive accessible transportation, a responsibility that should be shared with the rest of the industry. Leasing reform. The TLC regulates every aspect of the lease between driver and owner of a yellow cab, but no aspect of the arrangement between FH owners and drivers. This stifles flexibility because drivers and owners lack the legal authority to agree on fair, reasonable leasing terms that best suit their needs. We urge drivers, owners, regulators, and lawmakers to work together to make leasing more affordable and provide drivers and owners with greater flexibility to meet the needs of the industry. We need to promote Effect, efficient vehicles and congestion mitigation. Taxi cabs average 20 to 30 trips a day. Other four hire vehicles, about four. Yet the number of taxi cabs is fixed and burdened with mandates that do little to improve service, while the lightly regulated four hire industry continues to increase by record numbers, and the number of licensed four hire vehicles bears no relationship to the demand for service, especially accessible service. New and creative ways can be developed to promote the use of vehicles that encourage the greatest number of trips per vehicle, everything from more dedicated areas for exclusive taxi pickups, allowing taxi cabs to use bus lanes and improve taxi flows, and providing additional service in vehicles that have demonstrated efficiency in providing large numbers of, of passengers, such as the bill uh, you have suggested that you will be introduced in the next few days. Fines imposed against those who ignore the law and TLC rules should not merely be a cost of doing business. All segments of the industry must obey all of the laws and regulations and that are in effect or face serious consequences. Everyone must obey traffic and public safety laws. Street hail should not be permitted by vehicles not authorized to do so. Anti-hustling laws should be enforced against unlicensed hustlers. Livery and black car bases should comply with all regulations from off-street parking and anti-nuisance laws for livery bases to attorney general requirements relating to franchises and cooperatives for black car bases. No one should be exempt from the requirements of law regulating their industries. TPEP monitors every aspect of the taxi cab industry, yet there is no equivalent in the for hire sector. The taxi cab industry has placed nearly 2,000 accessible vehicles in service without any consideration as to whether it's demand for the service, whether these vehicles are suitable as use as taxi cabs, and whether drivers will operate them. The other regulated industries of the for hire sector, with the exception of street hail liveries, have made little or no commitment to accessibility. The TLC has begun the process of reviewing this issue. Now, finally, to address the bill, we support the, the bill that's up for uh, discussion today to create the task, task force, but time is of the essence. It's urgent that we take action. We need to act now. A six-month period, we don't know if this industry will be surviving in its present form six months from now. We need action now. Task force is a good st first step, but we need to start thinking today how we're going to do this. And I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today, allowing me to go over my three minutes, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Wow, what an honor to sit in on this panel and also to follow the uh, owner drivers. Hmm. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and Transportation Committee members. My name is David Pollock, the president of the Taxi Cab Service Association, known as the TSA. Our membership consists of credit unions who have been lending on the medallion asset and some for many decades. The TSA. Uh, has come to offer a solution for stakeholders who have been abandoned. Economics 101 shows that an industry dependent on drivers becomes worthless without an abundant driving workforce. 
we have a solution that will solidify the current workforce while enlisting new drivers to drive wheelchair accessible vehicles in New York City, thereby increasing medallion values. If you're keeping score, three major New York City medallion credit unions have been placed into receivership caused by a workforce shortage. That said, the more a driver can earn while driving a medallion taxi, the more it's worth because the asset is generating more income. Our plan will assure an increase in driver earnings with a minimal effect on the current FHV models. Uh, background. The great migration of yellow cab drivers leaving to drive for app companies began approximately four years ago with the introduction of wheelchair accessible vehicles known as waves as yellow cabs. Driving a yellow cab became an unattractive job. Over three years ago, in these very chambers and at the Taxi and Limousine Commission, industry advocates warned that a disruption and a devaluation of the New York City taxi medallion would occur, leaving stakeholders abandoned and leading to thousands of New Yorkers losing their small businesses with collateral unemployment. Two years ago, we saw the introduction of 963. Obviously, the formation of a medallion value tax force, task force is long overdue, and based on the current financial situation within the medallion industry, the TSA applauds this hearing and supports the task force. It should also be noted that during that time, the TLC made regulation changes for the benefit of the industry, but it is obviously not enough. The budget predictions on surcharges for the Transportation Improvement Fund, known as the TIF, and the MTA have not met their goals due to this disruption. And at this time, there are approximately 800 medallions sitting idle in storage, and many other wheelchair-accessible uh, vehicles sitting without drivers. Current vehicle inequality is not sustainable in any way unless all segments of the New York City transportation industry agree on a plan. Uh, we mentioned 1,800 wheelchair accessible medallions. How many of those are in storage at the Taxi and Limousine Commission? Uh, here's a plan. It's a simple plan. It's a logical plan. A surcharge on every app-based fare earmarked specifically for the TIF. That will allow the current 50-cent wave driver incentive to be increased to $3 per fare instead of 50 cents. This simple but effective solution will stop the exodus of drivers from the yellow sector, and New York City can rely on this wave force to service all handicapped communities, including Accessoride. Additionally, with the use of new driver technologies, like the Lacus Drivers app, current yellow drivers can reserve a yellow cab minutes from their home and start working without having to waste time driving to work or driving in and out of Manhattan during rush hours when everyone complains there's no yellow caps. Please count on the TSA for any financial input and suggestions regarding this plan. I also urge you to appoint Robert Famelant, the CEO of Progressive Credit Union, to fill the vacancy of medallion lender on this task force. Thank you. and committee. My name is Cassandra perez Dizier. I'm with Bolton St. John's on behalf of the Committee for Taxi Safety, and we support the bills being introduced. Uh, it's good that the Council wants to understand the medallion values. It is, however, something that we all already know. Taxis have been largely burdened with regulations that don't apply to any other segment in the for hire industry. For example, we are mandated into one car, the Nissan NV200, otherwise known as the taxi of tomorrow. The car was not originally designed to be an accessible vehicle, and the city nonetheless entered a settlement requiring that half of all taxis have to become accessible by 2020. The car was also not designed to be fuel efficient as hybrid vehicles. The most popular vehicle as a taxi in the run-up to this program was the Camry Hybrid. It is no accident that today Uber stands at 70 percent of their vehicles as Camry Hybrids. It is also the predominant vehicle in liveries and black cars. The Camry Hybrid has proven to be good for the environment, passengers, and drivers, as they don't have to spend more and more money on gas. The city made the wrong choice in the taxi of tomorrow by picking a car that was not by original design accessible or as fuel efficient as the Camry. This failure has a direct correlation between the time drivers started abandoning taxis for services like Uber, which would give them the car of their choice without restriction from the city of New York. Uber existed with taxis for four years without any drivers abandoning taxis for that service. And it was only the advent of the Taxi of Tomorrow program 
and the accessibility program that literally drove drivers from taxis to services that would give them the cars they wanted. Medallions, if not on the road and that are fully financed, now stand in storage at over 800, according to TLC data. Take into account that there are hundreds of taxis of tomorrow sitting idle every day in New York City, hoping drivers will take a chance on driving a less fuel efficient car than drive the hybrid of their choice. And yes, there are other attractions to drivers to drive other services, but every full-time driver knows the best way to make money is by driving a yellow taxi that is hybrid. By denying justice on one segment and preventing them to have choices is not only going to plummet values of medallions, but will keep the service from being on the streets of New York. It is an iconic brand and a product and the product that is the fabric of New York, a locally grown business that government and industry doesn't play by any set of the rules but their own and has caused jeopardy to. Thank you for your time. Arthur Goldstein with the firm of Davidoff, Hutcher and Citron, representing the Taxicab Service Association. I don't have a prepared statement, so just a couple of comments. Um, many of the faces that you see here on the panel and a number in the audience came to council members years ago basically saying we're going to be here. It took a few years and there's been a lot of damage done as David just mentioned. Uh, three of our members are uh, the credit unions are in conservatorships. That's what we were saying this was going to lead to. And so picking up what, what Peter said, uh, we, we can't just keep using the phrase uh, we need a level playing field. Time is of the essence. We need to act now. This task force is, is, is something we all favor, but when are you going to pass it? How soon is it going to have its first meeting? We need to go downstairs in a conference room and just w work out the details. We know all the issues. They've all laid it out very well, which is why I knew I didn't have to have a prepared statement. We need to act now. We know it's accessibility. The surcharge is probably the best route to go on, on, on that. It's the uh, allowing the Camry hybrid, the hybrid Camry, uh, to, to give flexibility to, to, to the industry. And you yourself, Mr. Chairman, have made a statement recently about the need for a cap. Now, we were calling for it when I think there were 13,000 vehicles or so, maybe 11 we started. And now we're at 66,000 or so, 70. Uh, 100,000 FHVs on the road today, according to the TLC website. So we are, we are well beyond, uh, you know, the, the point of return unless we just get into a conference room and say, this is the route we're going to go, draft the legislation within a few days, and run with it. That's where we're at at this point, because I don't know when I'll lose the fourth lender. Thank you very much. We're open for questions. You want to say something? No. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is for anybody. Um, and I mean it with all sincerity. How are you still in business, given everything that's happened to this industry? Uh, I don't take that lightly at all. And I'm here today. I'm not a member of the Transportation Committee, but I have many, many uh, people who live in my district who uh, have supported themselves driving yellow cabs. So um, I was particularly alarmed um, by Mr. Mazur's comments on uh, the fact that if something's not done quickly within six months, there's, I didn't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounded as if you, you were suggesting that this industry just wouldn't survive. Well, there are elements of this industry that won't survive. I'll just since you directed it to me, I'll lead, it, lead off. There are people that won't survive. The industry as a whole, um, we, we, we're here because we have confidence in this industry and we're optimistic. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We'd all be doing something else and give up on this. Um, I, for one, said that there, there, we had a time in this in industry, and I've been doing this for a long time. I've been in this industry for ni since 1987 and spent about the first half of my life with the TLC and the second half of my life fighting the TLC. Uh, so, uh, and now not fighting the TLC as much, but maybe trying to work together with the TLC to uh, right the ship. But 
I saw times back in the, in the late um, in the late eighties when there was no confidence in this industry and we thought things were really bad. Then we did. Then we saw confidence in this industry and we saw uh, a, t a time of growth and everybody felt good about it. We're here because we do feel that there are good things uh, about this industry. The thing that I, the one thing that I said today that I really believe that still sticks in my mind is the most important thing about this industry is every day. 300 to 350,000 people walk out in the street and they raise their hand and they want yellow. They don't want an Uber, they don't want Lyft, they don't want anything else. They don't want an unlicensed gypsy cab coming from uh, Pennsylvania to pick them up. Uh, they don't want a hustler at the airport, they want a yellow cab. And, the, and they want a yellow cab because they've come to realize that yellow cabs are what provides safe, reliable service in this city. So we are optimistic, and that's why we're here. We don't think things are good. I'm not uh, belittling it. We, we, I, I had somebody come to my office the other day, owns two medallions, put $600,000 cash when they bought the medallions in 2012, paid $2 million for it. They owe $1.4 million on the loan. The balloon payment has now come due. They don't know what to do. The two medallions are worth maybe $400,000. They have a house. And the bank has said, you know what, we'll, we'll, we'll take your two medallions and we'll take the house and we'll call it a day. And I don't know what to tell him. I, I, I told him maybe go, go talk to a bankruptcy lawyer or you know, some other advice because there's nothing to do. Now, the $600,000 that they put on the table five years ago, that's lost. The medallions, that's lost. Now they're looking at maybe trying to save their house. Yeah, I've, and, I've, I've heard those stories as well, yeah. you know, and it, it's, it's – you know, when you're losing your house, it's a big deal. Uh, but on the other hand, how do you, how do you tell a lender? H how do you get confidence in this industry with lenders if you tell them, oh, we're going to forgive all the loans, and then, uh, and then you're going to go to the bank and say, oh, well, we want you to start to, re uh, to lend again. But, you know, if, you don't, if somebody doesn't pay back, we're going to make, let's just say forget about it. So you, 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 the way you build conf you have to have confidence. You have to give a lender a reason to lend. You have to give... Uh, someone a reason to stay in this industry, and, and uh, I think. Well, we you know, we uh, certainly I think yeah. it's become clear to, to me today. Certainly, it was clear already, but much clearer in focus that you know we need to level the playing field. Um, you know, when you play baseball, one team gets three outs in innings. It's as if you're giving the opposition six outs in inning. When I coached little league, I told my kids, when you make errors and you give up, you allow the other team five or six outs in inning, you're going to lose. And, and it's not really different here with the, you know, with this industry. So um, I think, you know, that we certainly need to level the playing field the for everybody. The only thing I would say on that point, to be very careful on that, in some cities elsewhere, leveling the playing field meant deregulating the t entire taxi cab industry, opening up the market to everybody. We kind of, we, we have a market now outside of New York City. The gov governor signed a TNC bill, anybody in a private car, any place outside of the five boroughs, can take their private car and sign up with Uber and Lyft. Drive. Well, we have a finite number of streets and a finite, you know, we, we can't continue to load our streets up uh, as we've been doing with uh, people prowling for fares. It's just not going to work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council. Thank you, Council Member, and we're going to be working together. Yes, sir. In the, you know, to be sure that we continue doing our part. You know, we've been... Since the first day chairing this community transportation, we've been to do the best we can to help this in, the, especially the yellow taxi industry. You know, it's coming from someone that I used to be a little bit taxi driver. But I also know that, you know, it doesn't matter the type of taxi that you drove. You know, it was being behind the wheel that allowed me to save some money, go to school their time, be able to graduate and become a teacher being here today. That should be the same dream opportunity of any hardworking people who are driving a taxi. So I know that we, you know, you've been dealing with a tough time because those 70,000 new cars, they are not, they don't have to do the same investment. So whatever we can do, let's be sure that we coordinate together. Thank you. Now we're calling the next panel. And I'm going to say that we're calling for a meeting the next month. And you're going to be invited to that meeting, okay? Thank you. Uh, next panel, Edith Pre Princeton, Nicole Erfstein, Nicola Hent, Lucio Riccio, and Richard Lipsky. I get a good 
keep going and I'll turn into a pumpkin. Thank you. All right, thank you. This is important. I'm glad I understand. So take, take your right to see if that is something that you want to be yeah. co-planned. Yes, okay. This is, a, is so, a, what, do you have it here? So my Again. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Lucius Riccio, former New York City Transport. I'm Lucius Riccio, former New York City Transportation Commissioner and MTA board member, and now professor at Columbia University. Thank you for this opportunity to address the committee. I've attached um, to my written testimony, which you have, also my recent op-ed, "Opinion Piece in Cranes in New York Business." And in that article, and during several TV appearances and radio appearances, I've made my opinion well known that I believe several significant policy mistakes have been made which have led to our current unsustainable and economically undesirable situation for sur surface transportation in New York City, particularly in Manhattan. I want to thank you for initiating this new inquiry because we are in a moment of crisis. And I'm taking a slightly different perspective. I'm a transportation planner type. I want to take that perspective, uh, which I think supplements all the other good things you've heard today. New York City has limited st street space to provide a livable, economically viable environment. How it uses that street space is essential to New York's future growth. Although New York City has America's most extensive public transportation network, a system critical to life in our city, it also has the best regulated yellow taxi system in America, a model for the country and for big cities around the globe. It was created to provide professional surface transportation services. Before it was created over 80 years ago, surface transportation was a wild west of vehicles and drivers. We seem to have forgotten that purpose and instead have ushered in a new wild west era. It was created recognizing that due to our density and limited street space, not everyone can drive around or be driven around. The yellows were to serve as the appropriate and exclusive alternative to the mass transit system. Together, these two systems have enabled New York City to be the great city it truly is. Black car for hire vehicles were created in the late 70s to serve a very limited upscale clientele, Wall Street banks, law firms, special events. Two major mistakes were made at that point, and this has been pointed out before in other testimony. First, no limitation was imposed on the number of FHVs that would, allow, or would be allowed to operate. It was assumed that the free market would regulate the amount to an inconsequentially small number due to their considerably higher charges. The other mistake was that they were not charged an entry fee, as the yellows had been, denying the city billions of dollars of additional revenue. Years later, one more crucial mistake was made. When the BlackBerry was invented around the year 2000, I told the yellow industry that they that that device would soon have a picture of a cab which when tapped would send a signal to someone that someone wanted a cab and that one would then be assigned to that person. The yellow industry did nothing with that suggestion. Rather than stealing the march, just like Eastman Kodak regarding digital cameras, they did not prepare for a changing world. When Uber came along, it represented itself to be a new and exciting transportation alternative. The media played it up that way, investors threw money at it, and they still do, and politicians sat idly by under the guise of free market capitalism. In reality, Uber is just a car and a driver. From a transportation standpoint, nothing is new. But from a customer service standpoint, the app seemed revolutionary. That along with the investor and government subsidized lower charges made Uber look like the next big thing. Those mistakes, 
and the media puffed misguided illusion resulted in this out of control situation we now face. The new for hire vehicles, Uber, Lyft, Get Via, are not, to use a chic term, disrupting our essential transportation systems, which New York City desperately needs, but are to a real extent destroying them by creating congestion for buses, trucks, and emergency vehicles. Bruce Schaller's excellent report documents the unsustainability, unregulated, and unlimited policy currently in effect. Congestion is an all time high and getting worse. Air quality is getting worse from the addition of tens of thousands of vehicles we don't need on the road. MTA ridership is being affected, threatening the long-term viability of that critical asset. You, Mr. Chairman, have the opportunity to stop, start the process to correct all that. In addition, the city has lost out on billions of dollars of revenue which could have been used for public infrastructure. The failure to charge a medallion-type entry fee and the failure to charge the 50-cent MTA fee has cost the city billions of additional dollars the MTA so obviously needs. The committee needs to consider institution, instituting such fees. I should also mention the city was making real progress with Yellows to provide an alternative for disabled. These new for hire vehicles have provided little, if any, with that community. I find it unconscionable that nothing is being done to recognize the contribution of the yellow industry. As for the medallion owners, the city has violated the medallion contract. Each medallion came with the exclusive right to the unplanned, non prearranged, spontaneous ride demand. This contract was formally reinforced at least twice. First, when black cars were created, regulations and enforcement policies were put in place to keep them from poaching rides from the yellow cabs. Second, the contract was reaffirmed, particularly for the lucrative mid Manhattan market, with the creation of the green cabs. The city took people's money when medallions were purchased. That money was not a gift to the city. It was a contract, a contract for the exclusive right to those rides. The city has, in my mind, the obligation to behold that contract or return that money plus damages back to the medallion owners. I hope the courts would support such an obvious conclusion or at least force the city to adopt a fair policy. I recognize that the chairman and this committee has said today that they also feel very strongly about such concerns. Now, if such a new policy was considered, uh, because we have an untenable situation, let me make my suggestions. First, establish a for hire vehicle baseline number, grant grandfather status to all base affiliated for hire vehicles registered with the TLC as of, say, 2008 or 2010, and exempt them from new fees and limitations. I think that would be fair to them. Second, all new for hire vehicles since then operating as e hail pickup in Manhattan Zone must either pay a flat fee of, say, $10,000 per year or a pickup fee of $5 per year, I upped it, David, uh, per ride, $5 per ride, with 50 cents going to the MTA and the rest of the city. They must register to operate as such and provide all digital and financial data. Fines for non-registered for hire vehicles picking up Manhattan should be set at a very high level, say $25,000. Third, the number of for hire vehicles allowed to register for e-hail in Manhattan would be limited to the number of sold yellow medallions. If the city wants more for hire vehicles to operate in medallion as e-hail vehicles, it must first sell additional medallions. That limit then would be about 13,587 at this point. I offer these suggestions in an attempt to correct the mess we are in now. As the city grows, and that's what we want for our city, it will depend more and more on smart transportation policy and infrastructure decisions. I congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, and this committee for recognizing the urgency of these matters. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicole Epstein. I'm here on behalf of NIETA, New Yorkers for Equal Transportation Access. It's a coalition of immigrant medallion owners along with disability rights advocates. So, you know, I wanted to start this off with, we all know that Uber is the taxi-free taxi company. Every single new policy regulation that the TLC has come up with or the city council that has come up with is based on the idea that Uber owns no vehicles. We can't mandate accessibility requirements because these are people's car, you know, everyday cars. It's your mom going to a soccer game, you know, bringing her kids, using her minivan, or whatever it may be. These aren't cars that are in constant circulation. And 
Commissioner Joshi kind of touched on this. Oh, we lowered inspection uh, mandates. We took out black car retirement because of this. Well, I want to give you guys a little fact that hasn't really been discussed, and that's that Uber owns a whole fleet of vehicles. Is there any wonder why every single you know, car that's on the road is the same? That's a TL, you know, TLC for hire vehicle. It's all the same, and I can assure you it's not because everyone has the same taste in car. It, that's not the reason. It's because Uber owns a fleet of vehicles. In fact, not only do they own a fleet of vehicles, they're forcing the new Uber drivers into subprime loan agreements to use their vehicles that they're recycling over and over again. Do an easy Google search. You'll see that all these new vehicles, the Uber drivers are writing, my car brakes don't work. I can't, they want me to pay $500 a week for this rental to Uber, to use Uber's car, $500 a week. And then Uber takes the payment directly out of their Uber earnings every week. You want to tell me Uber doesn't own a car? You want to say we can't enforce accessibility requirements? We can't enforce TPEP requirements for the safety of New York citizens because Uber doesn't own a car? There's so many, a simple Google search will show you that they own all these cars and not only do they own them, they place tracking devices in their vehicles because when their Uber drivers aren't making $500 a week to pay for these cars, what happens? A little alarm sound goes off, Uber comes, takes the vehicle back, repossesses the car, and damages and totally ruins these people's credits. They say, okay, they're very smart. Who needs vehicles? Who needs vehicles? Who needs the jobs? It's a lot of immigrants, same exact thing, a lot of immigrants. A lot of people are like, yeah, this sounds good. Oh, I'll sign this agreement with Uber, pay 500 bucks a week, and then drive for Uber to take all my money. They slash their fares, increase their commission, shortchange their drivers, they have created the modern day slavery and New York City is reducing the regulations for them. These cars have, aren't working. They're not safe. We don't have any tracking devices. And then we say, oh, we can't regulate them. These are people's individual vehicles. It's a different industry. It's a total fiction. It's a lie. And this is where it needs to start. This is where the playing field will get even. Once that myth is debunked, then we can move forward. And my testimony has a lot more facts in there and I'm willing to meet with you and talk about this more. I think we have to, for, uh, my name is Edith Prentice. I'm the chair of the taxes for all campaign. I think we need to start with the fact that when Uber came into New York, the TLC was barely enforcing the then for hire vehicle equivalent service contract. And the situation has gotten ridiculously worse. Um, I remember sitting through the Lyft hearings, which were hysterical. I mean, the judge simply said, these are the rules of New York City. This is the way it's going to be. You want to have taxis in New York City? This is what you're going to do. When we start talking about the level pay playing field, I question whether we're part of that. Obviously, People with disabilities and people who need accessible vehicles are not part of that. In fact, the um, MTA Accessoride pilot program only includes 10% of accessible vehicles, while 28% of the population who uses Accessoride require accessible vehicles. I see a big gap there. Um, the, the MTA and Accessoride have been discussing this pilot program. It seems probably since the beginning of Accessoride. I do exaggerate. But we've been discussing this pilot, and we're still in a pilot, and we're on probably the third or fourth pilot. How much longer is it going to take? Um, getting rid of the big white buses and moving to accessible and inaccessible vehicles. There are lots of inaccessible vehicles in accessible rights. You really should know that. Uh, will make a tremendous change. The incredible amount of money 
the MTA spends on accessoride would be cut tremendously. At present, accessoride calculates the cost of a trip. Their contracts require about $65 a trip. The proposed contract with taxis is approximately 30. Many individuals cannot afford to pay for taxis, and this would be a tremendous change. Uh, I recently paid $80 from 2 Broadway to Washington Heights, $50 from Grand Central, 36 from 23rd Street to 150th Street. We need a major change. We need the inclusion of people with disabilities. I was, it's very uncomfortable because it, it, I'm made to feel like we're the cause of the problem. I'm sorry, there was a settlement, the city accepted it, it's 50%. They have to now figure out a way to make parity, not try to take service away from the disability community. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nikolai Hand. I'm a cab driver for 30 years. I will have 30 years in January. I am an immigrant, legal immigrant, and I'm proud, to, proud, I'm proud to be. I am a medallion owner since 1990. City government took my money for exclusive rights, and now they take my bread away. In other words, exactly how you go to the ATM machines, and I wait outside and take your money. When I lose, city of New York lose in revenue. For example, in the year 2011, I pay for the New York City $3,231 in 50 cents, MTA. In 2016, I pay for the New York City $2,200. $40 in ATM machine. It's a thousand dollars less. And then 216, I didn't want to took vacation, I took in 211. I as as an owner, I heard that the TLC chairman saying they want uh, something to le level the playing field. Um, the TLC owners uh, the, uh, chairman said she doesn't have the jurisdiction. New York City government should have the jurisdiction. Not New York State, not legislator from uh, Utica or Rochester. We, New York City legislator, should take action for this. We make the law for New York City, not Governor Cuomo or uh, Attorney General Schneiderman, which is supposed to watch the governor in Albany because the uh, Sp uh, silver speaker is convicted. Rick Schello, the same. Why is Governor Cuomo not? because the three of them make the deals all the time. Before Governor Cuomo, uh, uh, his father was a, a, a governor, and his speaker of the house was convicted too, Mel Miller. Now, you want to level the playing field? You want to be up working in New York City? Come up with the money. Come up with uh, uh, 10,000 a, a, a year or 15,000 a year, just like I did. You want to level the playing field? Make the medallions, 13,587 medallions, 13,587 apps. I cannot compete with somebody which has free license and I have to pay a lot of money for that. It's impossible. I like competition. Competition is good for consumer, but has to be fair and square. Other things is save the congestion by limiting cars and enforcement. That's what I have to say for now. I hope in the future I, I, I can uh, uh, prove more. Thank you. What? Okay. Good afternoon, Chair. Um, I feel like uh, Zsa Zsa Gabor's seventh husband. 
uh, I know what to do, but how do you make it interesting? We are here today, and listening to Chair Joshi, I'm reminded of the old story of the man who fell out of the 12-story window. When he got past the third floor, someone looked out and said, how are you doing? He said, so far, so good. <laughs> We're almost there at the bottom, Mr. Chair. But I want to explode one major, uh, major myth here. And that's the, the canard that these people in this room are afraid of competition, that they're being put out because they can't compete. That is the biggest lie I have ever heard. Uh, for 35 years, I've represented immigrant business people in this city, whether it's supermarket owners, whether it's bodega owners, whether it's Hispanic beer distributors, all against big government, and big business. And they were never afraid to compete. But what they didn't want is when the government put their thumb on the scale, when the government made rules to affect their businesses, but not the big businesses. That's what's happened here today. The myth is that they can't compete. But the reality is, Mr. Chair, that it is the city of New York that has been the culprit in all of the failures of this industry. The city of New York created a franchise. The city of New York, and I think in the private sector, it's called fraud in the inducement. The city of New York created a franchise and said, you got nothing to worry about. We got your back. And as my friend Nino Hervia said, when we turned around and looked at our back, we saw the knife sticking into it. You can't create a system of rules and regulations, and Council Member Gradenchik made a good point with the Little League. When you have a rule-based system, you have referees, whether they're regulators or they're elected officials. Now, sometimes, as uh, Barry knows, you try to work the refs to get a better deal. But in this case, Someone else has worked the refs pretty damn good, and it ain't us. Now, I've seen my friend and colleague Arthur Goldstein's been uh, lobbying for 25 years, good lobbyist. My friend uh, Brad Gerstmann is another good lobbyist. I've been lobbying for 30 years. I've never seen an issue like this. It's an issue where, and in all my other fights, Walmart, Pathmark, Budweiser, whatever it was, we always had elected officials to watch our back. Now they're missing in action. This is the first time, Mr. Chair, and you are to be credited for putting this hearing together. We are, and, and Council Member Gradenchik, Council Member Chin, Council Member uh, Danick Miller, Council Member uh, Greenfield, thank you. Shout out to all of you. But now, the only thing missing here is will. I used to tell my kids all the time, you have to be a pessimist of intellect, but an optimist of will. We have only been missing will and leadership. And now, we need to do that right away before anything else bad happens. What we've seen over the last two years, someone has had a thumb on the scale, and that has to be looked at. Take the thumb off the scale, assume the mantle of leadership. If you do, this industry will survive and grow and prosper. Thank you. Thank you, and as I said to the previous panel, we will continue this conversation. I gotta say that it's not only, this is not the first hearing. For the last three years, we've been in the middle of this fight. But sometimes we are not, we are not the only player in the, in the field. You know, the opposition to, you know, to level the playing field, they've been investing millions of dollars in the past, you know, going after using the media. And we were, I personally was one of those who they went after. When we were trying, the bill to cap is my bill. The bill to increase the surcharge is my bill, together with Councilmember Greenfield. 
Uh, I believe it is also the time for the 6,000 medallion owners to come together and organize. Uh, I, and I challenge, you know, that sector too. Uh, we've been trying to do the best we can, but we also have limitations. You have seen the last couple of months also how the whole discussion moved to Albany. And there have been, you know, a lot of investing, investment when it comes to, you know, try to, you know, put things in place that only benefit one sector. So I will continue and hear her councilman credential too. We will continue doing the best we can. But we also need your support. We also need you to be organized, to move, you know, take this, you fight to another level. Because, you know, you are the voice of the voiceless. There's other thousands of people who sometimes they lost hope. And they believe there is nothing we can do right now. But I believe it is possible to do that. Thank you, and calling the next panel. So, Condor Singh, Mike Simon, Osman, Kojuri, and Opkar Teng, Bernardo Celerino. This is the last panel, so if I miss anybody else who fill out your paper to testify, please let us know, but this is the last panel that we have today. May I begin? Hello. Okay. Okay. Dear council men and women, a lot of the things I'm going to say were already said, but it probably should be said again, and I'm sure it should be said again because there's a wrong that's being done. And I feel a little bit like, like guilty here or something. I'm not, I'm here to take something back that was taken from me. You know, I mean, we're here seeming like asking you for something, but this was ours, this was taken from us. Like land is taken from us, or something that was ours that is taken from us. So I feel like I, I want to speak in a, in, in a way that's, that says, hey, I've been wrong. They took something from me, something that I've been doing for 40 years, and, and it's not right, it's not fair. And, and what, what do I do? You, you asked us to be organized. What do I do, Mr. Rodriguez? What do I do as an individual? I, don't, I said before at a, at a different hearing, I don't have a research and development department. I'm not a big company. You know, I, I just run cabs. And, and uh, you know, I'm here and I'm trying to do something by speaking. But, you know, um, we have to, we have to, there's a wrong that's being done, and you know I'm going to try hard to do my best to to correct that wrong. But it's a fight because something was taken away. What I bought, they gave away for not, for nothing. That's like that's like you know somebody asking you to pay for something, and then the next person comes along and they give that same thing away for free. That just doesn't make sense. And how do you think about that? What, how do you feel about that? What do you think about the person who did that? Why did you do that? So, you know, I have a, a written transcript that I'm going to read, but basically my feelings are, are like something was wrong here. You know, a, a, like something, a crime was committed, a wrong was being committed. And it has to be corrected. And then if it's not corrected, it's going to get corrected because the wrong will not be able to be wrong. Just like, I mean, the Indians, they took, they, they broke the treaties with the Indians. We went, we're not like, it's not like anybody was killed in our industry or anything like that. But that was a wrong and that never went away. Hundreds of years later, it never went away. This will never go away. You can't take something in, from somebody in America and get away with it. You can't do it. 
So here's, here's what I wrote. Low medallion value basically is due to the city not having our back. Why was the medallion secure? Because you protected us. No one wanted to mess with the Big Apple. The rights that medallion owners bought were meant to provide a financial benefit to its owner. Uber arrived and you let our exclusive slide. I have heard now that it's instantaneous and anonymous. I try hard to figure out what that is. Sometimes when a person is on the street, they wait for a few minutes for a taxi. That's not instantaneous. Yes, we don't know who the driver is when we hail a cab, but we do know that he's appropriately licensed. And maybe in the future it won't be anonymous. Maybe your, fo your phone will tell you who the driver is. The taxis are dying because the TLC claims there's a new technology, and we are of the old world. This is an excuse for wanting the black car apps to function. The technology is just a new way to hail, and when we bought our rights, we bought them for future circumstances just such as this. That's why it says in the law, and I quote, now and in the future. Are yellow cabs supposed to compete with every car manufacturer in the future, producing vehicles that will be used as New York City taxi cabs through EL? And we have no way out. Owners are forced to drive while the value of their medallion is worth less than what they owe. What do we expect them to do? They can't stop driving and they can't lease the medallion. They can't find drivers. The current puzzle of FHV and taxis existing together have created tension and depression for taxi owners, an untenable work situation where drivers and owner drivers feel humiliated when people pass them by and wait for Uber. We feel, what right do they have? They didn't have to buy a medallion, and yet they do the same thing. It is degrading. That hurts us competitively, not to mention the overhead costs of financing and paying it off, not even knowing whether it's worth anything or not. Why would anyone buy anything when they can get the same thing for free? It's downright nasty and weird. The current CEO of Uber, and I quote from the New York Times, it's critical that we act with integrity in everything we do and learn how to be a better partner to every city we operate in. If that's the case, then why shouldn't they be trying to, why should they be trying to crush a service to New York City that is as important as the yellow cab? Sorry, please summarize. One thing I know, unlike Uber, yellows are not going to get up one morning and tell you they are leaving. We are New York. Isn't that in itself a reason to treat us differently and specially? Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Council, for being here today. This is a kind of 911 call to the city of New York regarding the protection to my industry. I am one of the 6,000 people you mentioned before not to mention also another 3,000 people who owns two taxis instead of one that is usually called mini fleets. Sorry, for your record. Thank you. My name is Bernardo J. Celorino. Yeah. Can, can Michael you? Simon. Okay. My taxi, my hack license begins with the number 412, which is basically hack license who I have for more than 32 years. So I know something about the industry. To me today, my risk is not over. I'm not fear of lift. Our biggest enemy, by far, is the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. I noticed when Council Member Greenfield was asking uh, the TLC chairwoman sitting here, where I'm sitting now, about the way that she can, what she can do to defend the industry, to protect the value of my medallion, and she was just flying with the answer. There was not a straight answer about any plan about what to do to prevent my medallion uh, value to be lowering. Today we are talking that the price of a medallion is maybe 15% of the value that it has at the top time. And as I said, this is a 911 call. We need to do something very important. One of the few things we need to do in the next three weeks, if possible, somebody had to make a proposal, somebody like you, for example, had to make a proposal to the city of New York is to drop the 50 cents 
to the MTA. MTA does not need $60 million a year or $80 million a year from the tax industry. They have 70 or 80,000 Uber guys, and they don't pay nothing. He never requested one penny from them. It's because they just don't need the money. Very simple. If they don't need the money from Uber, they don't need the money from us. So one of the few things is drop the 50 cents. Another thing, very important, Uber is allowed to charge $10 when somebody, when a passenger declines a call. If tomorrow you call Uber, you go to the street to flag down with a cell phone like this, and a taxi cab goes empty, you cannot take it. Because if you want to take the yellow cab, you got to pay $10 fine to Uber. That should be dropped. And that was approved by the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Okay? Basically, I want to say also that in the year 2003, Council Member John Liu helped to pass local law number 60 of the year 2003. That law was to name something called DAB. For those people who doesn't know who DAB means, it's a driver's advisory board that's supposed to have been created in the year 2003. It was never created because the Taxi and Limousine Commission never pushed for that. Guess what? In the year 2013, Mr. Alan Fromberg, he knows very well, he was sitting next to me on the third row, somebody, some commissioner, decided to dissolve the DAV that was never created, okay? So now we have no voice. So we have to thank you for calling us here today to say something to you because we cannot say things as a DAB. Thank you, Council. Good afternoon, Council Member and uh, Chair Rodriguez, and especially for special thanks to you and Patty Credentials. Salute you guys. I'm amazed that uh, we are here today. What are your name to? Seth, Seth Winder Singh, Medallion Owner, and also I belong to T Moda, Taxi Medallion Owner Association. Thank you. I heard many things, like first thing, let's go to the bottom. First thing, when you purchase a medallion, we purchased a hailing, the street hail ride, and we paid millions of it. Means instant pickup, that's only owns medallion owner who paid millions to the city and the TLC. Instant pickup means if person ready to out to have a ride, and there's a cab for him. When they made that law, there was no technology, sir. That's it. You raise your hand, go in the street, and hail the cab. And that's your right. When the technology came, they should amend the law. Where's my rights there? If who, who doesn't have a phone? What you see in the street when you raise your hand, taxi cab and the driver in it. When you see here, same thing, but I paid millions. Th those people who have that right is being stolen from us and paid nothing, and they're doing the same thing like we do. How we compete with the 70,000 cabs doing the same thing, what we doing, what we paid for it, there's, there's no law for them. And the person sitting home, why he need the yellow cab out in the rain on the street? Rather, he can push the button, and that cab is cheaper than me. Is that, isn't that amazing how we compete then? When there's a rush hour, they can charge anything they want. If there's no work out, they can lower the price 10 times than me. How I can compete with them? And so that should be recognized. They should amend the law. I always think with my organization, organization, if any city council member or any TLC, any officer want to make the law, they should put the lag time. That my right going through the phone or either through the hand, it should be if, if there's a black car, suppose any app companies, they have to have, okay, the first 10 minutes that job is going to my app. If I don't pick up, if I don't have enough cabs in that area, that, that, that fare should go to the black cars. That's my right. And this is the first thing we can do it to stop them 
to make this huge, big rampart. Otherwise, I think if we don't recognize this right, everything is impossible. And really, really thank you. Last one thing more. I appreciate that I always think there's many things to say that you add two cabs in my medallion so we can survive. And third, bankruptcy lawyer, when we go there, you know what they ask now? How many house you own? How much loan you have? If you have a more loans, they're happy because you will be get rid of from the bankrupt by the bankruptcy. If you paid your house, my friend, you're in trouble. Please recognize this. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Abkathin. I'm an uh, owner driver of New York City Medallion. And I'm not going to repeat uh, and bore you with what's already been stated, but I do have a couple of suggestions which can be quick, instant fixes for the yellow industry. Mrs. Joshi, who has often said it's a free market, but won't allow us to use any vehicle model or make to become taxes, including used cars. Um, and uh, one other further one would be reduce our medallion renewal fees, which are currently about 1750 and have less inspections for the yellows. And lastly, I'm going to, this may be uh, wishful thinking, but if you could somehow have our loans forgiven, in return we will lower our fares. Uh, this will be a win-win situation for all involved, uh, especially the, the customers. And lastly, I urge you, Mr. Rodriguez, please run for the speaker position. Thank you. Again, as I said before, we will continue doing the best we can. A state meeting is on Wednesday. We're going to be introducing the bill, so we will most likely follow you guys to be together. On a, that will find out the time so that we can be together as we're going to be introducing the bill that is not a solution, but at least we're trying to put things in place that can help to alleviate so that with someone on a medallion to be able to say we can have two cars with that medallion. At the same time also that we have to continue having a conversation of putting a cap, you know, to the other sector that they don't have any, any limitation how many cars they can have in the street. It's all about being fair to everyone. 60 million tourists last year came to New York City. 8.5 million New Yorkers live in the city. There's opportunity for everyone to make the living, but people should play by the same rule and regulation. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.